Constituency, our observers, Justice Am Raphael Misaga from the Commonwealth Secretariat, Ms. Meline Glean of the Organization of American States, Mr. Dwight Clay of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, Mr. Sas Bunraj of CARICOM, Ms. Karen Privo, Secretary to the Cabinet, Permanent Secretaries, Dr. Kenneth Darrow, Special Envoy in the Office of the Prime Minister with Responsibility for Electoral Modernization. Mr. Duncan Stewart, Chairman of the Electoral Commission. Executive members of the Dominican Labour Party. Mr. Carlos Charles, Leader of Team Unity and other members of Team Unity. Mr. Nicholas George, General Secretary of the United Workers' Party and other members of the United Workers' Party. Mr. Bernard Ito, political leader of the Dominica Freedom Party, who is joining us via Zoom, and other members of the Dominica Freedom Party, independent candidates from the 2022 general elections, all other invited guests, members of the media, good evening. I wish to welcome you to night two of the consultations on electoral reform. We heard from members of the legal fraternity yesterday evening and we will hear from politicians and political parties this evening. I am pleased that you accepted the government's invitation to be here and to share your views on a matter of extreme national importance. The issue of electoral reform has been on the agenda for many years now, and we now have the opportunity to comment on an independent report on the electoral modernization of Dominica's electoral process. Hopefully, you would have had the opportunity to thoroughly review the report that was prepared by Sir Dennis. It is presented in two parts, phase one and phase two. The report has been widely circulated by the government. Some of you received printed copies on the 21st of June. Others would have accessed it on the government website. The report contains Sir Dennis's recommendations on several issues and includes draft bills and regulations to give effect to his recommendations. I think it is important to note that although Sir Dennis was engaged by the government in carrying out his assignment, the process was managed by the Electoral Commission. And Sir Dennis has clearly said that his report is independent and impartial and that he executed his duties without fear or favor. I also think it is important to note what was stated in the Commonwealth Secretariat Election Management Compendium of Commonwealth Good Practice 2016. And this was adopted by Sir Dennis in his report. And I quote, no country has a perfect electoral or democratic system. And no election management body is beyond review or criticism. Democracy and the efforts to realize this ideal through elections are always a work in progress, end quote. So this is a work in progress for Dominica. The Prime Minister indicated that he would hold a series of public consultations to receive feedback on the report and the draft legislation, and this will continue over the next few weeks. I wish to also especially welcome tonight the representatives from the Commonwealth Secretariat, the OAS, CARICOM, and the OECS, who are observing and participating in this consultation process. Present with us is Justice Am Raphael Misaga from Kenya, representing the Commonwealth, Ms. Meline Green from the OAS, Mr. Sas Gunrad, representing CARICOM, and Mr. Dwight Lee from the OECS. Welcome, and thank you for being here with us. As you deliberate tonight on the electoral report, you have the opportunity to shape what our electoral landscape will look like for the foreseeable future. 
you most likely will not agree on everything, but perhaps through dialogue we can agree on some key matters that can collectively be taken forward to advance, modernize, and improve our electoral process. I wish now to invite the Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Levi Peter, to give a brief overview of the report and the recommendations, and then we will open up the floor for your feedback, comments, clarifications, and suggestions. Attorney General? Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Honorable Prime Minister, Cabinet colleagues, uh, other guests um, and attendees. Good evening to all. Uh, I will try to take note of the slight hint that I was given that it's brief and try to make it as brief as possible. Um, but at the same time, doing justice um, to the overview. I should start by saying that this, this presentation, as all of the presentations that will be made during the course of these consultations, is intended to provide an overview of the recommendations by Sir Dennis Byron in his report and accompanying draft legislation, and to highlight significant areas of proposed change to Dominica's electoral system. The presentation is not intended to be a commentary on the report and accompanying draft legislation, nor is it intended to be a detailed exposition of the provisions of those documents or the expression of opinion, whether my own opinion or that of the government. The intention is to seek to give an outline, as certainly I'm presenting it, so as I see it, and of course, you may have a different view. And of course, if you do, you will um, operate on that view. The report was submitted in two phases. Phase one focuses, according to uh, Sir Dennis, on cleansing of the voters list with emphasis on voter identification and the voter registration system and includes a legislative framework which is comprised of two bills, namely the Registration of Electors Act of 2023, which I will henceforth refer to as the new Registration of Electors Act and the Registration of Electors Regulations 2023. Structurally, the report, according to Sir Dennis, sought to address in the second phase, one, the electoral process, primarily access to the media and com campaign financing, two, the electoral commission, um, several components there, the composition, financial autonomy, staffing, appointment of committees, resignation procedure, and protection from suit. From suit sorry. And the third is new legislation. So, so Dennis, um, with his report, submitted four pieces of draft legislation that are proposed to be used um, in the modernization of Dominica's electoral system. Uh, essentially, the House of Assembly Elections Act 2023, House of Assembly Elections Regulations 2023, Electoral Commission Bill 2023 and the House of Assembly Elections um, Petitions Reg and Rules 2023. So, phase one. Phase one of the report, the Registration of Electors Act, um, the new REA, substantially reflects the existing um, Registration of Electors Act and is intended to repeal and replace the existing Act. Uh, the most significant parts of the proposed new REA, from a reform perspective or a modernization perspective, are parts three and five, I would suggest, which introduce new concepts and provisions intended to give effect to the report's recommendations in relation to the registration of electors. So part three. Part three sets out a number of issues and requirements which must be satisfied in order for a person's name to be entered or remain in the register of electors. These verification requirements include the following. One, residency. Two, registration. Three, ID cards. Four, investigation. And five, confirmation. Residency is the first of the, those elements, and uh, in my view, it could be said that there are two distinct components to this. One relates to a person's entitlement to be registered to vote, and the other relates to the circumstance in which a person is deprived of his entitlement to remain registered and to vote. 
Component 1 is provided for in Clause 71C of the new Registration of Electors Act and requires that the persons applying for registration must have been resident in the polling district for a period of at least three months immediately preceding the application for registration. This does not change the existing law. The other component, however, does, and it is, in my view, a significant component and a significant consideration for this consultation. That component is introduced by way of Clause 26 of the new proposed bill, and it proposes a dramatic change to the existing situation and definition of absent from Dominica. Clause 26.1 states, a person whose name is in the register of electors and who lives outside Dominica shall not be regarded as having been absent from Dominica for the purpose of Section 12.1b, 13.4b, or 15.3b, if in the five-year period immediately preceding the date of the last publication of the Register of Electors, the person visited and remained in Dominica for a period of at least 90 or alternatively 50 days for the periods amount or for periods amounting to at least 90 or 50 days. Clearly that's a change from the existing position which provides that as long as a person has been in Dominica at least once within the five-year period that we're referring to, he or she is entitled to remain on the register uh, and to uh, be able to cast a vote. This pr proposal would significantly change that. It would change it by way of, for, for example, the absence from Dominica point. Section 26.1 would abolish the existing right, as I've just said, and replace it by the 90 or 50 day requirement. The knock-on effect of that is that the, there would be an increase in the period that a registered person would have to spend in Dominica so as to continue to enjoy the benefit of being registered. And that would be reflected at Clause 12b-2 of the new provision if it is enacted as proposed. It would also increase the number of people who would be removed from the register um, in accordance with the new clause 13.4b and 15b. Sorry, 15.3b. So that's in relation to residence. In relation to registration, the proposed um, drafts do not significantly um, amend the existing position. Um, there are two aspects in which it amends the, the existing provision. One is in relation to um, providing that 17-year-olds will be able to apply for registration, though they will not actually be placed on the register until they attain the age of 18 years of age. And the second is that state employees stationed overseas, example, diplomats and staff of diplomatic um, 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 embassies and so forth, will be deemed to, be, to reside at a particular address provided they had given prior notice of that address by way of a declaration to the chief registering officer. The third element is identification cards, which would go towards verification. And the recommendation of Sir Dennis is for the mandatory use of what's described in the report as national identification cards for the purpose of voting. This is to be found at clause 11 of the new Registration of Electors Act. The fourth element of verification is increased is, is investigations, and that has three components, I suggest. One is increased des, um, discretion to the chief registering officer and the um, electoral officials. That's addressed at clause nine of the um, new provision. It also would provide at clause nine five for a new offense, namely refusing to furnish information requested or, or providing false information to the chief registering officer. The second component of, of this investigatory element is the increased investigatory powers that clause 10 will provide to the chief registering officer and um, the staff or the official electoral, of, electoral officials uh, to enable them to have wider powers to seek information by way of investigation um, than they currently have on the wording of the existing um, legislation. 
And the third is a requirement that's proposed that various public officers would be obliged to provide uh, information to the chief registering officer. Um, and two of those officials, uh, just to mention, there are several, but just to mention two. One is a permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who would be required to provide details to the chief, sorry, chief reg registration officer of the names of every person who is in service overseas, who is a, who is a registered elector or eligible to be so, and thirdly, every person within the service who is no, sorry, every person who is no longer in overseas service. And the second um, official is the chairman of the Mental Health Review Board, who, the, who will be required to provide the name, street address, date of birth, and occupation of every person who has been certified as having a mental disorder as defined by the Mental Health Act. Um, and of course, there are dates provided by which those officials would have to do so. There are also requirements for the Commission of Police and others to provide information. So the last slide there was a suggestion or it was a statement that there's no requirement for um, the police to provide information in respect to immigration. That's not actually um, um, accurate under the provision that I've just referred to, one of the officials who shall provide information as per the draft is the Commissioner of Police. Um, that obviously is a, a matter which may um, be discussed further in the consultation. And, and finally, insofar as, conf as verification is concerned, um, is the issue of confirmation. That's a new um, innovation if it is, if it is adopted but certainly on the uh, recommendation, uh, it provides for uh, confirmation of registration. And that's at, cl at part five, clauses 50 to 56. And that would entail people who are actually on the register of electors having within a stipulated time frame that would be set out um, by the commission would have to confirm their registration so as to remain on the register of electors and not have their names removed. Um, that's a, a, an interesting new uh, provision, uh, and I'm sure that will have formed some, some part of the discussion. Moving to phase two, phase two of the report, so then it's described as uh, primarily seeking to address institutional matters. Um, I've already indicated the four pieces of legislation that um, underpin that phase two, and the institutional matters to which Sir Dennis uh, referred uh, primarily are, uh, one, access to the media, which is addressed at part three of, of, of phase two, um, more specifically clause 50, use of electronic voting systems, which is addressed at part four, campaign financing, which is addressed at part five, and election petitions, which are, um, is addressed at part seven. So then it's also addressed the issue of the um, electoral commission um, to the point that he makes various various um, proposals in the report um, and those proposals are reflected in the um, draft electoral, electoral commission bill uh, that is that has been submitted by Sir Dennis. And so far as access to the media is, is concerned um, that would be a, a new innovation um, in terms of legislating for it um, and it would require, if Sir Dennis's proposals are adopted, that um, equal time is given to all political parties and independent candidates to have access to state-owned media during the campaign period. And it's notable that that is state-owned media and not private um, media, perhaps for fairly obvious reasons. Um, and the... Um, the, the, legis the proposed legislation also defines what is, what is meant by the campaign period. The second uh, element is part four, which is the electronic voting system. That is, um, as, as the name suggests, fairly straightforward. So Dennis um, proposes that subject to a number of conditions being met and um, the, the satisfaction that the equipment is fit for purpose and such like, that um, electronic voting systems should be used um, for the purposes of elections in Dominica. Thirdly, the issue of campaign financing, which is a part, part five, 
and that's covered uh, in clauses 54 to 75 of the House of Assembly Elections uh, Act 2023. Um, largely, clauses 54 to 63 deal with campaign um, contributions. Clauses 64 to 65 deal with campaign expenditure. Clauses 66 to 75 deal with miscellaneous matters such as report, submission of reports, um, audited returns, publication of reports by the Electoral Commission, and so forth. It is notable that um, the proposal also carries with it the recommendation that there be various um, offences uh, which would attract, according to the proposal, uh, penalties ranging from $6,000 or 12 months imprisonment in relation to the Clause 53 free offence to $10,000 or 12 months imprisonment for the Clause 70 um, um, offence. Finally, the Electoral Commission the report recommends that the changes to be made um, and the enactment of the Electoral Commission Act. And that really, the Act really refers financial autonomy is referred to at Clause 12. Um, it also deals with establishment of the Electoral Commission Fund. Under that, the annual payment of a specified amount into the fund and administration of the fund. It also proposes a certain autonomy to the um, commission in relation to the appointment of staff. It also proposes a requirement for disclosure by all members of the commission or committees, um, also the chief elections officer and any employee of the commission. If um, any private, they have any private interest in a matter which is under consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That is the end of my contribution. Thank you very much, Attorney General. Um, we would, you would have heard a synopsis of some of the key points arising from the report of Sir Dennis. Some of you may have very strong views on what is in the report or what ought to be in the report. You will all have the opportunity to share your views and perspectives on this and to say what you would like to see taken to Parliament to modernize our electoral process. When you take the floor, please indicate who you are and if you are speaking on behalf of a, of a party, please indicate which one and, um, and then make your comments. I ask that we all respect each other's point of view and we allow people to share uh, their views un uninterrupted. The sessions are being recorded, so uh, you will not see me taking copious notes, but the transcribers are taking note of all of your points. If you have a prepared response, you are welcome to come to the podium to deliver it, or you can remain in your seat if you wish, and there's a roving mic that will be brought to you so that you can provide your comments. Um, to those that, who are joining us online, they can raise a virtual hand so that they can uh, make their intervention as well. So I would, with, with, without further ado, I would declare the floor open. So um, anybody who wants to share, they're welcome to do so now. Anybody wants to start the ball rolling? Okay. <laughs> okay. Would you like to speak from here? Sure. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. My name is Honorable Jesse Paul Victor, leader of the opposition. Protocol has already been established. I am pleased to be here this evening at this consultation on electoral reform. I am also delighted that we have in our midst at this time officials from the Organization of American States, the Commonwealth, and the Caribbean community. This report by Sir Dennis Byron incorporates many of the recommendations your organizations have made over the last four election cycles 2009, 2014, 2019, and 2022. This report by Sir Dennis Byron is an improvement on Dominica's existing electoral laws. 
but there are other recommendations which I believe would further strengthen our electoral system. It is my sincere hope that this consultation exercise is not just a public relations activity, but an opportunity for all stakeholders and the Dominican populace as a whole to reach a consensus on the best way forward for electing Dominico. <laughs> Further, I endorse fully an idea put forward by the president of the Dominica Bar Association last evening, Noelis Knight Didier, that a committee should be set up to conduct an in-depth review of the proposed legislation by Sir Dennis and include the new recommendations coming out of the consultations now on the way. Let me now turn my attention to Sir Dennis's Byron report. I was surprised that um, Sir Dennis in his report did not state explicitly that the transportation of voters from overseas into Dominica by air and sea constituted bribery and treating and was therefore a crime under all electoral laws. Under reforms proposed by Sir Dennis, for example, he makes it easier for a Dominican ordinarily resident overseas to visit Dominica between 50 and 90 days in a five-year period or to be eligible to vote. Presently, once you visit Dominica, once in a five-year period, you are eligible to vote. I believe it is manifestly unfair for Dominicans who have made the decision to leave Dominica and reside overseas, presently have a disproportionate power to dilute the voting intentions of Dominicans who actually live in the country. With respect to campaign finance reform, my view is not that the proposed legislation does not go far enough. There should be a limit as to the amount of money political parties can spend before the writ is issued by the president and during the election campaign. Sir Dennis Byron is proposing a limit of five million Eastern Caribbean dollars, which in a small economy like Dominica with a small population seems very excessive. Foreign companies and individuals in foreign governments should be barred from contributing to the election campaign of any candidate or any political party whatsoever. There should be an expanded electoral commission from the current five members to nine to include civil society organizations, the business community, the Dominican Bar Association, trade unions, and the religious community to be appointed by the president. The voter ID card should be issued to all eligible voters in Dominica specify the constituency the voter can vote, and it must contain biometric data, including fingerprinting. Someone with a national ID may not be eligible to vote. We, in the parliamentary opposition, propose new financing arrangements for, electoral com for, for the Electoral Commission. Parliament should approve the budget for the commission. For the commission. All political parties in Dominica should have an equal access to both states and privately owned media in Dominica during an election campaign. This consultation exercise on electoral reform is a once in a generation opportunity. However, it is in our view that electoral reform should be a continuous process to be revisited from time to time by the electoral commission. We in the opposition, we understand that some of the reforms that we are suggesting would involve amendments to the Constitution. This can potentially delay the electoral reform process. But if we are going to do something as important as this, we need to do it right. In summary, this electoral reform exercise must ultimately deliver regular cleansing of the voters list, issuance of voter ID cards, legislating against treating and bribery, eliminating the power of big money in our election campaigns, the creation of virtual constituencies, and reforms to the Electoral Commission. I sincerely hope that as this consultation exercise gains momentum, all ideas will contend. At the end of this exercise, 
It is my desire that what we take to Parliament will have broad consensus and acceptance throughout Dominica. The reforms should not be skewed towards favoring one political party at the expense to another. We all want to live for this and future generations a robust electoral system that delivers free and fair elections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Paul Victor, Honorable Paul Victor. I, I, you're very clear, except I just wanted clarity on one thing that you said. In, I, I, was, I didn't quite understand what you said about the five-year period. Um, are you saying that the um, persons who reside out of Dominica should not be allowed to vote? I'm, I'm not quite sure what your point was in relation to that. You want to just clarify that for us, please, to make sure that we capture it properly? Uh, can, can we have the mic, please? In relation to the um, Dominicans being outside of uh, Dominica for in excess of five years, um, I wasn't quite sure what you said in relation to that, what your recommendation would be. I think you spoke to um, it being unfair for voters living outside of Dominica to dilute the votes of persons in Dominica. Uh, so I wanted to be clear on what, you, what, what, what your recommendation was in relation to that. that only persons who are residing in Dominica should be allowed to vote? There must be a particular there must be that if you have been outside of Dominica in excess of five years then you are liable to be removed from the register. Um, the, so Dennis said in his report that the question of absence from Dominica was not defined. So his recommendations is that persons who have been uh, absent from Dominica means persons who within a five year period have, been, um, have, have not been in Dominica for either a period of 90 days or 50 days. So the absence of, of, from Dominica uh, would if you've been gone for five years, but you've been to Dominica, you've visited for 90 days, then you will not be disqualified. Or you've been there for 50 days and you should not be disqualified. He's given two options. So are you saying that you favor either of those options or um, what, what, what would you prefer? So let me just, just, just to clarify again. Um, when you, once you're on the register, so you would have qualified to be on the register uh, regularly. You've left Dominica. 
If you reside outside of Dominica, if you're absent from Dominica for a period of five years, you are liable to be removed from the register. Now, Sir Dennis has identified that the question of absence from Dominica has caused confusion over the years. So he has proposed a definition of what absence should be. His proposal is that if you have, if you, if you should be deemed not to have been absent if you have returned to Dominica within that five year period for a total of 90 days, or he has given an alternative of 50 days. Right, so that is to deal with the question of interpreting your absence from Dominica for you to be liable to be struck off the register. So what I'm seeking to find out, are you, are you in agreement with what Sir Dennis has said that the period of, to determine what absence is, you would have to be in Dominica within a five year period for at least 90 days or 50 days. Are you in agreement with that or you have an alternative um, suggestion to put forward? that should be pre presented um, should include fingerprints. And if I, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that you're not, no, not no, in favor no, of fingerprints. No, 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 I represent the body. The no, people you represent. The people I represent. Okay. That, that because we never have that okay. election, I'm going to speak the truth. In election. Mm -hmm. Because I, I test the field. I did test the field to know what is politics and what the people want. Right. In election, doesn't matter what a man do to win, right? And he don't have to win, he can win if the people don't want him. No matter he, they say he TV do. No, if the people really doesn't want to so scary, they will fool him out. So that's simple. If he has been doing his work for the past time, it has been excellent. And we have been voting without ID card. I can understand, yeah, there's a query for ID card. But there, there are some people that they doesn't want the world to know everything about them. With, with the fingerprint, laser fingerprint, it go to the entire internet. No, I cannot. Uh, I, I, I cannot. I am not as a, as a share. I'm stakeholder. 
I'm not shareholder, I'm stakeholder. Maybe Mr. Dr. Ferrer is a shareholder. You see there? I tell him be present. I'm a stakeholder and I'm studying stakeholder. My purpose for coming there is to understand stakeholder and type in. Just a quick comment on this question of the disqualification of voters not resident in Dominica. The proposed registration of electors bill allows voters who have not been ordinarily resident in Dominica for more than five years to remain on the voters register as not absent from Dominica if they visit Dominica for an aggregate of 90 days or 50 days over the 1,825 days in the five-year period. Dominicans are registered to vote in Dominica for election of representatives to the House of Assembly if they are ordinarily resident in Dominica in a particular polling district. So when they are no longer ordinarily resident in Dominica for a period of more than five years, that should be the basis of the disqualification. It should not be whether they are absent from Dominica, which has been interpreted to mean that they can be treated as ordinarily resident in Dominica based on visiting Dominica and being temporarily absent from their place of ordinary residence overseas. Now, the Constitution of Section 332A provides for Parliament to prescribe legislation re relating to residence and domicile. Residence in contrast to presence involves a settled and enduring connection between persons and a place. The term residence excludes tourist and casual place. Now section 7C of the existing Registration of Electors Act provides for a person's name to be removed from the register because he has been absent from Dominica for a period exceeding five years. According to section 113B of the existing Registration of Electors Act, the preliminary register shall not include persons who, quote, since the publication of the last register, not being citizens of the Commonwealth of Dominica, have departed from Dominica, and on the 30th of March of any such year, to be no longer ordinarily resident in that polling district. And this is consistent with the provisions of 33 2A of the Constitution. I want to make the point that this business of ordinarily resident is in our legislation. And we made a mistake along the way where residents puts you on the register of electors, but absence takes you out. Now, what is provided for in the exist in the proposed Registration of Electors Act under the head eligibility for, re for registration 7-1 subject to the provisions of this act and any other enactment proposing a disqualification for registration as an elector a person is qualified for registration as an elector for a polling district if a person is either a citizen of Dominica or a commonwealth citizen who has resided in Dominica for a period of not less than 12 months immediately before the qualifying date, is 18 years of age and older, and has resided in that polling district for a continuous period of at least three months, immediately preceding the qualifying date. And it says further that the person shall not be registered as an elector until he or she has satisfied all the requirements of the Act, 
and all the regulations related to the registration of electors. Again, residents, the requirement to enter on the voters register. And then you have the registration of electors regulations, which defines place of ordinary residence. This is in the proposed, this is in the proposed new legislation. Place of ordinary residence is defined as, in, it says it's 6 1. In relation to the qualification of a person to be registered as an elector for polling district, a person shall be deemed to reside in a polling district in which he or she is ordinarily resident on a qualifying date. And two, the question whether a person is or was ordinarily resident at a place for any material period shall be determined by reference to all the facts of the case and the following provisions. A couple of the provisions. A place of ordinary residence shall be deemed to be, generally, the place which has always been or has been adopted by a person as a place of habitation or home, such that when away from there, the person intends to return. Where a person usually sleeps, in one place and has meals or is employed in another place, the place of ordinary residence shall be the place where the person sleeps. And this one is interesting. Temporary absence of a person from a place of ordinary residence does not cause the loss or change of the place of ordinary residence of the person. Our Dominican brothers and sisters, whom we love to death, have changed their place of ordinary residence. They're living overseas. And the law provides that when they have been overseas for more than five years, they say absent from Dominica. We're saying it, it ought not to have been absent. And electoral reform should mean setting things right. Provisions that are in line with our constitution and what's in line with the Constitution is not a definition of what it means to be absent from Dominica, but a definition of what it means to be no longer ordinarily resident in Dominica. So we should be, in reform, seeking to remove persons from the register who do not ordinarily reside in Dominica. And so we would recommend a definition of residence that clarifies what it means to be no longer ordinarily resident in Dominica for five years and therefore no longer qualified to be on the voters register. And simply, a person is deemed not to be ordinarily resident in Dominica if the person having traveled to another country to live and work indefinitely has resided outside of Dominica for a period exceeding five years, and it is immaterial whether the person visits Dominica during that period or intends ultimately to return to Dominica. That is what reform should be about. The flip side of that is deform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Linton. And so, just to be clear, you know, the, the, and that's the position of the United Workers Party that if you have been ordinarily, ordinarily resident outside of Dominica uh, for a period of five years, then you should be removed from the register. Yes, yes. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That has been captured. Uh, anybody else has any other comments that they would wish to make? We have people online as well. Um, if you want to come in, please, Mr. Bernard Ito. Can we unmute, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, sir. Are you okay? Yes, we can hear you. Can we have a little more volume, please? Sir, one second. How about now? Yes, we can hear you very well. All right, very good. All right, so um, 
As the leader of the Dominican Freedom Party, um, let me first extend the thanks of my party to the organizers who present our views to this forum. For the call having been established, and in the interest of time, let me just run straight away into uh, making our party's position and thereabouts clear. Uh, let us begin by noting that the DFP, along with other advocates for electoral reform, has been pursuing this goal for almost a decade. In that time, the current administration has repeatedly promised the citizenry and external observers that despite no action for many years, they are in fact committed to the spirit and intent of electoral reform. In the last few years, it appears finally that the government had finally able to call the citizenry to take some concrete steps to deal with the burning issue of electoral reform. The approach was to hire high priced consultants. The opposition voices, we protested that this money was could have been better spent given our present fiscal conditions. We argued that the reforms to be made were already well understood, given the work done by local reform advocates as well as by external electoral activities. Nonetheless, the government pressed ahead and to date has paid almost three quarters of a million dollars to serve to the Silver Dance Direct Consultation. The Dominican Freedom Party, while we are not pleased with that approach, nonetheless, we remain pragmatic because getting the reform was the important thing. As a result, the DFP has chosen to be sober, responsible, and pragmatic, as I said. We therefore chose to work closely with Sudan Inspire. We have participated in every consultation held and completed every survey conducted. We have worked hard and have made practical, thoughtful contributions we believe at every step of the process. Throughout the process, we have remained collaborative, conscientious citizens committed to the solutions-oriented idea. While we may not like all aspects of the sausage making, the most important thing was to ensure good electoral reform legislation was enacted. Thus, after much delay, Sudan's Tyrone has provided some draft legislation for review, revision, and adoption. And while the proposed legislation is not perfect by any means, the DFP was actually relieved to say it as a genuine step forward, some progress. We therefore decided once again to be a pragmatic, solution oriented party and roll up our sleeves and get to work again, instead of shouting about the flaws and problems. In that spirit, we set off to work with all the electoral reform advocates, as well as the ruling party, to craft a final bill that strengthens and protects our democracy. That's a good issue. We have even said more than that. The DFP has publicly declared that we believe that the bill is almost 80% there, that all sides can now sit together at the table, shoulder to shoulder, to look at the bill, tweak it, and arrive at a version we can all be proud of. While we may not have been very vocal about some of the ways this process was handled, we have been vocal. We're here today to go out on that limb with you, the ruling party, to help the government to keep the rewards of these efforts of electoral reform. So, with that orientation, let us look at a few critical issues and arguments of the Freedom Party. The issue of absence from government. My friends, what is wrong with the principle? That if you get the right vote, that you have to maintain some sort of minimal economic and social ties and make some minimal contribution to a while. Some have argued that Americans remain under our stuff forever, yes, but the citizens are also permanently under tax laws wherever they are in the world. We do not have them. Therefore, we must find a reasonable proxy for that contribution as a right to vote. It is only reasonable. We must be pragmatic and solution-oriented. We must also be fair. The fact is, it simply creates a moral hazard when the people who elect the government are different from the people who must bear the consequences of that government. This undermines the very principle of capability that is, in fact, the bedrock idea of democracy. When you wrote that, do you, in fact, truly really have a democracy? And so we must be fair and allow those in Ireland to have a decisive say in the government that they must live with by asking those abroad who wish to vote 
maintain a minimal level of involvement. But we also recognize the need of enfranchisement, participation, and economic and social contributions of the diaspora. That too is fair. They are invaluable to nation building. It's for this reason that the DFP has advocated for the establishment of external constituencies to enable the vote as well as empower the overseas voters by political parties having to pay for this specific concern. The windows of security. We advocate for that. But in the meantime, we must do what we can to make the system fair without disenfranchising our overseas brothers and sisters having minimal annual engagement with the island will in some small way tilt the playing field towards fairness. We therefore support the proposal of 90 days in the legislation. My friends, we must accept the realities of being a micro state and stop pretending that some rules that apply to an enormous country like the United States can apply to us without intelligent law. The US can allow unregulated policies moving because in almost no election can these votes be a determining factor. The percentage of these votes with the over 300 million Americans at home is minuscule. But in Dominica, the situation is reversed. There are provably more Dominicans living overseas than in Ireland. Overseas voters thus have the ability to determine almost every election in our tiny constituencies, almost all of which can have radically different outcomes like a swing of a few hundred overseas voters. Is this fair? I ask you, is this right? We say no. And the initial framers of our electoral laws grasp this, if only they knew that a unique situation and a history of massive migration necessitated some sort of safety, and they were careful to insert that into the law. Today, none of these realities have changed. In fact, migration trends have only accelerated. But instead of building and illuminating the ideas of the initial framers, we wish to strip out existing legislation and crumble the very foundation of that system on the issue of voter ID cards. It should be obvious to any serious observer that a serious electoral system needs to have solid voter ID cards. We all know the name national on the national ID card. The name national ID card is silly, given the fact that it is the manner of operation of voter ID card. One must wonder what the heck is underlying this convoluted idea. The voter ID card is crucial. In this digital age, we need a valid number that can be tracked in various databases and not simply rely on the name and address. Relying on names and addresses only is fraught with difficulties. For example, there are similar names, there are nicknames and other peculiarities. Validating a unique voter number before an election officer and that this number has not voted anywhere else for that region is critical and frankly trivial to do in this day of modern information systems. So we need it. A passport or other ID simply does not allow those additional safeguards, as Mrs. DGA argued eloquently in her presentation yesterday. The issue of campaign finance reform is obvious. It is desperate. It is so obvious why this is necessary that I will not go into further evaluation. We therefore simply say we embrace the legislation, realization of that urgent and critical need. But we know that the fines for violations are way too low. To be a deterrent. We believe that there should be election disqualification and other electoral penalties in addition to fines. Together, we can work through this. Let me say this final word on the issue of technological system. This is the digital age, the datification age. We therefore believe technology should be widely used to capture, record, and communicate registration and other relevant electoral information. This will allow citizens easy access to those lists and enable the wisdom of the crowds, something even Mr. Anthony uh, Aston mentioned, to ensure that this is accurate all the time. Ruling and opposition parties can maintain clear lists if we really want to, but the system must be set up to enable that to be confident. There are thus various places in the legislation where we must note the need of this digital data and means of communication. One key example is the ability of information systems to talk to each other. We are encouraged to see that the Act does require information, deaths, age, immigration records, and so on, to be transmitted to the electoral office. So we must have these systems interoperable 
and data formats appropriate to allow easy transmission. Digital immigration records are particularly important because this solves the issue of how to operationalize the Nigeria report. We seek not to have people in the now known and reported, but instead a simple quarterly database query to create a list of people on the register who have not been in Dominica for the past five years prior to the last publication. No one needs the details beyond the immigration department. The immigration department simply reads footage. A list of names of the register is required to do. So as the proposed register we have bail, requires the register to do for this. These are good things. These are progressive things. These are rational things. The intent is to move us towards a world-class electoral system. But frankly, so far in this consultation, we have been aghast that not only does the government not want to work with electoral reform applicants to pass a new bill, but that in fact they want to now pass a bill apparently even weaker than the current electoral legislation. The one protection of absence in the current law that limits the complete abandonment of the island, but still being allowed to vote, they wish to strip away a move that would allow any economic citizen to spend a few months in the get registered, and then live forever and never to return. But with careful coordination with fellow economic citizens of the various intent, set up a colonial system where they can vote as a bloc to ensure that the colonial government of the choice remain forever in power in the Remember, the tens of thousands. Is that really what we want for ourselves as a party who only a few days ago celebrated emancipation? We came into this discussion as a with the hope that the government had become so and pragmatic on this issue and was not willing to sit down in collaboration. But alas, it appears we have been silent. I hope I am. For getting rid of the absence was enough for us, but a catastrophic retrograde. So my friends tell me why the expanded almost a million dollars of taxpayers pay uh, pay dollars for. Was this just a pointless exercise? And more accurately, since the point simply aimed at ultimately weakening the current administration. Is that where we arrive? So let our international observers hit this, hit this dismantling. I hope they hear the acts lashing at the base of all the mobs. I hope they listen to the loud crash and smashes to the floor. Witness and pay careful attention for you will hear the consistent attack and the absence required in the legislation. You will hear it over and over again from the senior council who will embed himself in every session. Is he enough? You will hear it again and again from those carefully placed in the room so the session can record the people's voice, and I put that in quotes, asking for it to be removed. A cynical, dastardly, and obvious move. So pay careful attention, my friends, my foreign observers. So to this thing, as we move forward. But things do not have to be so. Today can be the day when we rewrite not just some legislation, but the political culture of our land. Today we can all elevate ourselves to be true stewards of land. Statesmen, stateswomen, who can work collaboratively to strengthen our democracy with no sense of self advancement or advantage. So, so this is an opportunity that prepares itself. The question is how will we act on this beauty? How will our strength of character? and our ability to be even bigger than we thought fair. Listen, the DLP claims that it is smarter than the opposition parties, that your party loves the American parties. Then all they ask is that the British friends swear they've dominated the electoral reform it needs and deserve. Be brave. No advantage to Look us in the eye on an equal playing field and try to give us names. And then we can both go down fighting like noble warriors. If you pass the current legislation, no one will still lose. Dominic is democracy. My friends, history is made of pivotal moments, and we are living in one. This is one where we get to determine what our political culture will be. Will it be one based on self interest, cynicism, continued tribalism? Or will, will we build a political culture based on cooperation? Transparency problem solving. We have an opportunity today to pivot our island. 
However, from comments made yesterday, the offer to sit in working committees and get a bill tweaked and passed before the end of the year has already been rejected. Where is the spirit of collaboration and problem solving in that? Is this then simply a two hour dog and pony show to proclaim collaboration, but without really doing it? So we will make the same appeal today. Will you take it? Will you embrace the moment and move the soul of our island upward again? minimum annual engagement, external constituencies, maintaining minimum level of engagement in Dominica. I just need to understand clearly your position on the provision that persons, Dominicans who reside outside of Dominica for more than five years and can be removed from the register. Now, there's a provision that has been put in the draft legislation proposed by Sir Dennis where he has sought to put a definition for what absence from Dominica would mean. He suggests either 90 days absence or, or sorry, 90 days presence in Dominica or 50 days presence in, presence in Dominica. Are you saying that you either agree with the 90 or 50 days um, or are you saying that once you reside out of Dominica for a particular period of time you should be removed? Just to be clear on what exactly your position is, or the Freedom Party's sure. position is in relation to the question of uh, five years absence from Dominica. No, I understand. Um, well, what I stated was, we are a problem-oriented, pragmatic party. Why we would advocate for the establishment of a separate, uh, you know, constituency for a civil vote? We are pragmatic. Accept. The interim solution will allow Dominican support that may take 90 days period over the five years period, that that is the minimal level of engagement that we should uh, require from a citizen of Dominican in lieu of being, having to pay taxes, that that is the minimum level of engagement that we should require good citizens of Dominican to, uh, to continue the privilege and the honor of voting in Dominican. Okay, thank you very much. That's very clear. Thank you. I believe that senior counsel, Astefan, wanted to come in. Uh, Mr. Astefan? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to clarify one or two things, because I know there are others who are to speak after me. Um, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the last speaker was, was actually saying. But insofar as he, he speaks or uh, spoke of contributions to the country, um, let me remind him, and let me remind the listeners, and let me inform the consultant that for many years, politicians, lawyers, economists are moved forcefully for the right of the diaspora to vote because of the significant contribution to the development of the country through remittances. At one stage, we now need to be the United Workers Party. We now need to that, talk to that. Argue that remittances from the persons in the our citizens, our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, was instrumental in the development of small businesses, banking systems, and so on. So now we are being told we should add the additional burden of some form of taxation as opposed to the remittances with the Canadian Supreme Court in France accepted as being a justification for the rights of citizens in the United States system. I just want to clarify a matter here. Reference was made by the chairman of the United Workers Party to the fact that the Constitution refers to the residents. Well, it does. But what he didn't say was this. Section 33 to A says every Commonwealth citizen of the age of 18 years and upwards who possesses such qualifications relating to residence or domicile. I just want to point out domicile clearly goes further than residence. 
They don't need as parliament registered shell unless he disqualified by parliament from registration as a voter. For the purpose of electing representatives, be entitled to be registered as such a voter in accordance with the provisions of any law in that we have for no other person may be so registered. So residence, the constitution says, is required for domicile. And we, I discussed yesterday how the census and the respondents have interpreted the word domicile. But when you read B, it says every person who is registered as aforesaid in any constituency shall, unless he is disqualified by parliament from voting in that constituency in any election of representative, be entitled, so entitled to vote in accordance with the provisions of the law. So you need residents and domicile for the purposes of registering, but once regist one registered, and the fact that residence was not required for the actual exercise of the vote is the fact that under the 1974 law, which we now seek in Tomei, permitted Dominicans who were resident overseas for more than five years to vote, even if they only came back on one or two occasions or for a week or two, and they never lost the right to vote because they were not resident at the date of the election. So I just wanted to clarify. I wanted to. I just wanted to clarify that the, the other issue about the right of the citizen in the diaspora to vote. We are. We are not saying that every. We, and I, I don't think we are going as far as the Senkis model of domicile, where if you were born in New York, but your mother or your father were resident in Senkis or the years before they left the country, you could. Register and vote in their constituency in which they live. Our position is certainly mine that once registered, you should not lose the right to vote simply because you can't meet a 50 day or 90 day um, period. And I should add in, 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 his, in his report, so that is, spoke to of in brackets 10 years. So, so that is his recommendation in his discussion at page 29 and at page 16 of the uh, draft amendment, left into the judgment of parliament whether or not it should be five or 10 years. All right? But our suggestion is we, we, our position clearly, clearly is that the imposition of a 50 or 90 day condition or, or, or premise will have the effect of disenfranchised person who have continued connections to the country, but who, because of jobs, marriage, education, health, whatever it is, may not be able to come back to Dominica as much as they would want to for 50 or 90 days. And we say that's an unnecessary barrier to the right of citizens to vote, who persons from 2005 were clamoring for their right to vote simply on the basis of cultural connections and limitations. And we should not deny them that. Right, simply because politicians or some politicians believe that the poison challenge of which they drink every election happens to be represented in the diaspora. That, that, that is absolutely wrong. And in fact, as I said yesterday, and I repeated again, international best practices, whether it's the United States, we heard from Jeffrey, my, my dear friend Jeffrey, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, and other places are removing limitations which would prohibit citizens who were initially resident in their country, because in the United States you have to give a resident when you go the registration. Once you had that residence before you left, you maintain the right to vote, whether you own for five or ten or fifteen years. And I don't know why there are some who suggest that why the international practice, best practices are heading into the sunlight to open up the umbrella for citizens who were initially resident the right to vote. We have some advocated oppressive measures to be put in place to deny them the right to vote. On the question of ID card, let me just say during the, the, the discussion of ID card is like taking a shotgun to shoot the hand. In my experience, I have zero knowledge of fraudulent voting or personalization voting, where somebody comes and seeks to vote in the name of another person or seeks to vote in, in, in two or three polling stations at the same time. 
and for the benefit of the observer. From, from the time we've had um, adult suffering, we have never had to do ID, we never use ID cards. If you were challenged by one of the court media, then you have you were obliged to, 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 take a, to make a declaration and it falls you were probably disqualified or lose your, your right to vote and be prosecuted. All of a sudden we're having this humongous fight over national card, ID card, voter card, when nobody has been able to mention at any time during this thing that we have a significant issue or an issue of fraudulent voting which can only be remedied by a specific type of biometric and as Mr. stakeholder said, intrusive conditions which, which you have to comply with the purposes of, of um, getting an ID card. I mean, let's, let's, let's really, the focus is on this consultation. It's to improve, it's to improve whatever it is that we have. But not to create a fiction in order to justify measures that may not be reasonably required to protect the, the interest of the election. The other stuff that was discussed, the confirmation process. The confirmation process would be a welcome situation, but as I mentioned yesterday, I, two chief justices of our Supreme Court in cases dealing with allegations against the voters made the point over and over and over again. If you have complaints about voting this, you have an obligation to exercise the statutory right of objection. It may be onerous, it may be costly, but there is that um, platform. The leader of the opposition said she surprised Sir Dennis Byron did not say that transporting the electoral constitutes a crime. We have a series of cases from the courts, and I'm, I'm hoping, um, Ms. Byron, you are the AD, let them have copies of the judgment that they have really question of providing transportation. For, for, for they say electors, we say supporters. In fact, in a recent decision from 2019, that Justice Glasgow said, and there was no, no appeal from it because when the appeal failed on the issue of a final decision, held that there was nothing unlawful or illegal for a political party to provide transportation to its supporters. We have had a number of decisions where the said treating and allegations of bribery was begun with a corrupt intent. Justice Anderson in the CCG said that treatment is not the mere giving of money, food, drinks, music, or whatever happened. It must be done with a corrupt intent. So that is why Sir Dennis, in his in 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 book, when he dealt with the question of why we are treated, said that the, the law as it stands reflects what the law universally is on why we are treated. Then there's the issue of free state and the electoral commission. Well, Madam Chairman, Madam Chairman, said, I'm sorry. These are constitutional matters in my view. These are not matters um, that concern the electoral reform process whatsoever. Constitution created the electoral commission and prescribed membership and procedures to be followed, etc. If that has to be changed, that has to be by, by referendum, but that wouldn't be anything outside my understanding of the ambit of an electoral reform and consultation. So I just, I just, I just, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I, I, I could mention, but I won't because I know that the other court. The only last point I want to make reform should be progressive, reform should be inclusive, reform should be enhancing and creating um, a, a culture and a principle of enfranchisement. All I've heard today is an articulation of a policy hostile to the diasporian vote. And it, I want to put in place measures to have them disenfranchised from the voters list. Even as somebody creates the leader of the opposite, I don't know what the leader of the opposite, create, create what she said. 
um, tell me some, some form of constituency that you would find only in the internet or Google that came, that came from, from some, some, somebody else. We cannot proceed on the basis of, of consultation and reform. Single-mindedly obsessed with getting rid of the diaspora vote and creating obligations for registration and ID card. As the stakeholder said, that might be oppressive to some. So, Madam Chair, this is what I, what I wanted to say at this stage. If there's any question you'd like to ask me, I'm, I'm, I'm available. Otherwise, I shall turn my mic and and listen to the rest of the Thank you very much, Mr. Astafan. I'll leave the AG to, um, to share with the leader of the opposition, if she so wishes, the cases that you referred to. Um, I think the be consultant. I think the consultants need to see it. To see that what is being discussed here as needed for the reform is set in law on the decision of the court that have been made. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Henderson has requested the floor, followed by Mr. Nicholas George. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I recall that in the beginning of the session, you gave the option. So I am utilizing the option to present from the podium. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for participating in this process. My job is a very difficult one as I speak on the behalf of the Dominican Labour Party, but also bear in mind that as a sitting member of the cabinet, it is a tight rope to walk where consultation, in order to be meaningful, must be an environment in which ideas can allow to flow. And I, as a member of parliament, the natural knee-jerk reaction is to respond to those from the opposition who have said things that you don't agree with. However, in the interest of ensuring that we have meaningful consultation, and not merely an opportunity, as someone said, I'm not sure what the gentleman in the diaspora, whom, by the way, I hope he qualifies to vote, <laughs> will, you know, it's not just a show. It's not a dog and pony show. It is an opportunity for us to have meaningful consultation. This is why the government has gone at length to ensure that we have the participation of observers from the Organization of American States, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the OECS Secretariat, and the CARICOM Secretariat. So we're very happy they are here to participate in this process. In order to continue making my contribution, I just wish to highlight a few broad points. Things that generally come to mind when one considers electoral modernization. Electoral modernization in the 21st century should be one which broadens rights, expand rights, not disenfranchisement, not in a way that makes it difficult for people to exercise their right to exercise the sanctity of their vote. It is also an opportunity to ensure that we place a very careful balance between protecting the electoral system and not taking away or encroaching on that right to vote, as well as ensuring that the state itself can sustain some of the recommendations that are contained in Sir Dennis' report. So, I will proceed by expressing our gratitude on behalf of the Dominican Labour Party to Sir Dennis for undertaking a commendable assignment of the electoral modernization of Dominica. The Dominica Labour Party is deeply committed to electoral modernization in Dominica and supports this initiative to modernize Dominica's electoral system. From the offset, it is important to set out the context for the discussion on electoral modernization in Dominica. 
elections in Dominica are held under the House of Assembly Elections Act, which was enacted in 1951 and has gone through various amendments. Every major political party in Dominica have participated in elections under this act. Some have won, some have lost, some have disappeared, and some have reincarnated. But that process is the process that we all know and have participated in. Voter registration in Dominica has been done under the Registration of Electors Act, which was enacted in 1974. Both Dominican citizens and non-Dominican Commonwealth citizens have been registered under the act and have exercised their rights to vote. Numerous elections petitions have been filed from 2000, challenging election results, but no evidence of voter fraud or voter impersonations have been established under these election petitions. It is the position of the Dominican Labour Party that the conduct of the holding of elections and the registration of voters be modernized to reflect international best practices as contained in the report by Sir Dennis. This project on the electoral modernization process is evidence of the commitment of the DLP as the party in government to international best practices to conduct elections in Dominica and to ensure that as we modernize the process that we can expand rights, enhance accessibility to the ballot and to ensure that Dominica can enjoy the franchise. It is the position of the Dominican Labour Party that the framework for electoral modernization must have at its core the expanding of the right to vote, not the diminishing of that right. It is, the, it is important to the Dominican Labour Party that under this modernization project, no voter is disenfranchised. And I keep using those words because I want us to think of those concepts as we speak of this whole modernization process. Because what we're talking about, whether it's not because here or overseas, it is really the right to vote, the sanctity of that vote. The TLP considers it most significant that the trend internationally has been to expand on the right to vote and to remove all obstacles. The position in Dominica is no different. The Dominica Labour Party therefore supports a modernization process which protects and encourages the rights of all Dominicans to vote and to participate in the democratic process. This modernization process should have, as a key component of its framework, the clear policy of removing and not placing any obstacles or restrictions on the right of all qualifying Dominicans to participate in the democratic process by freely voting in an open and transparent manner. So we'll move to some of the issues raised by Sir Dennis, those which are most topical. Obviously, there are several issues contained in the, in the report, and we will only speak tonight to those that are sort of controversial and have generated a lot of debates. Eligibility to vote. As highlighted by Sir Dennis in his report, the register of electors is the official list of persons who are eligible to vote in Dominica. Persons who are registered and eligible must have their franchise protected and can only be removed from the register upon due process where notice is given to them and they're given an opportunity and a right to be heard. Automatic removal without due process should never be accepted. So once we've accepted that premise, we can then move to some general discussion on how best to ensure that we protect the right to vote as contained in the recommendations by Sir Dennis. As, as was recognized by Sir Dennis, the Constitution provides that every Commonwealth citizen in Dominica who has attained the age of 18 years with relevant qualification related to residence or domicile shall, unless disqualified by Parliament, be entitled to be registered as a voter. It is therefore 
to be noted that persons who are eligible to vote include persons who are not citizens of Dominica, but who may be citizens of other Commonwealth countries. Qualification, disqualification, and ab absence from Dominica for over five years. I think that is the very difficult one. And this, it just brings to mind an idea that disenfranchisement is no substitute or should not be a substitute for hard, old-fashioned political work. Kissing babies, you know, and that sort of thing, you know, hitting the, the road and doing all the canvassing and the, all the hard work that needs to be done. But it seems that sometimes the conversation moves towards making some people's work easier for them by disenfranchising people from exercising the right to vote. That is not Dominican. That is not democratic. While the Dominican Labour Party will not be tonight stating clearly its position on a number of those issues, we are encouraging the discussion because we know we have several nights ahead of us of meaningful consultation. In, in his report, Sir Byron states that one of the controversies which he identified was the extent to which residents in or citizenship of the Commonwealth of Dominica should be the predominant criteria for voting. Section 33 2A of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica prescribes that every Commonwealth citizen of the age of 18 years or upwards who possesses such qualifications relating to residence or domicile in Dominica as Parliament may prescribe shall, unless he is disqualified by Parliament from registration as a voter for the purpose of electing representatives, be entitled to be registered as such a voter in accordance with the provisions of any law in that behalf. So it is the parliament that has the responsibility and the authority to define residence, domicile, for the purpose of being registered to vote and for exercising that right to vote. The Dominican Labour Party recognizes that the five years disqualification in the present law creates a real risk of injustice for Dominicans who are resident overseas, but have maintained a real and substantial connection with their homeland, whether by way of remittance, support for their family, mortgages, or other considerations. That is to say, sending their barrels home once in a while. And the point that was made that there should be some real connection to sort of mirror what is done by the United States of America is oversimplifying a very complex system, as we heard by the leader of the Freedom Party, and is also going down a dangerous road from whence we came. That is to say, your right to vote at one point was determined by your ownership of property. You had to be a landowner to vote at some point. And what we have, what we are hearing now, this is why, from the outset, I said, please pay attention to what is at stake your right to vote. I am not going to do like the Republicans in the United States and talk about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, and that any regulation is an encroachment on such right that you may eventually lose. I am not going to frighten people. But it seems to me from some of the views expressed, we may need to examine the implications of some of those recommendations more closely, lest we are deprived our right to vote. Registration and confirmation. So, sorry, but let me just state before the moderator asked me, what is the position of the DLP on the absence of Dominica and the recommendation by Sir Dennis, whether there should be a 90 or 50 day residence in Dominica. We are of the view that this is a matter that must, be, must continue to be discussed, but we firmly hold the view that Dominicans should never lost their, their right to vote. We have heard some views expressed that there should be no limits, for there should be no minimum re residence requirements, and there should be no term limits 
within which you can lose that right to vote. In other words, once registered, a Dominican, as a citizen of the Commonwealth of Dominica, should continue to enjoy that right. We have heard those views expressed. We are not opposed to them. And we, but we would like, at the end of the consultation, to be guided by the wishes of the people of Dominica. And we know what they will they wish. Registration and confirmation. So Dennis proposes a system for the confirmation of electors when the new Registration of Electors Act comes into effect. Under that system, an elector who is registered on the date when the new act comes into effect is entitled to be registered on the preliminary register on that day. Every person, however, must apply to have their registration confirmed with the period established by the Electoral Commission. And the name of the person who is not confirmed shall be deleted from the register of voters. Now, there's a big discussion and debate as to how this should be done. Should the Electoral Commission visit capitals throughout the world to encourage Dominicans to be confirmed? So there is, there is one school of thought that this is how it should be done. But the guy in Alaska is asking, but I still have to get to New York. I might as well just go to Dominica. So some people are also saying people should be invited home and to confirm their registration. The Dominica Labour Party is not holding strong to any position, except to say that we are in support of the confirmation process, not a re-registration process, where once your name appears on the register of voters, you will be allowed to confirm your registration, whether it be here, at home, or abroad, as the consultation may finally determine. So we are open to that. So we are not, we are not opposed to the, the system of confirmation. Registration of electors and national ID card. Last night was, was very illuminating, I must say, listening to the discussion, and I hope this is the spirit in which the consultations will continue. There are views that, by many, that, and let me just, sorry, go to what Sir Dennis says, which is what I was hoping that some of the contributors would have done. And clearly, it, it is helpful to me, having read both reports and the draft um, legislation. I guess someone who may not have had that opportunity makes it difficult to present and to articulate some of those positions um, freely. But um, Sir Dennis proposes the introduction of voter identification card to persons registered as electors supported by biometric data and regarded this with an essential to eliminate or minimize fraudulent activities on election, including voter impersonation and multiple voting. The Dominica Labour Party notes, however, that there had, be, had been no evidence of fraudulent conduct referred to by Sir Dennis. Absolutely no evidence of voter impersonation and multiple voting in Dominica. The Dominica Labour Party wholeheartedly supports a system to objectively identify voters. This is not based on any assumption of voter impersonation or multiply voting, but based rather on the objective standard of international best practice. I am saying this to make the point that while we are prepared to modernize the system, that is to say the Dominican Labour Party is committed to this process, we are not doing it because we are trying to fix a broken system. We are doing it because we are aligning ourselves with international best practices and we are seeking to protect the system from any future abuse or misuse. The issue of biometric data remains debatable. Many are of the view, and I heard my almost father from St. Joe, um, Mr. Jomay, Mr. Ferdinand, said that he had a problem with the, the laser fingerprint, but I think it's the biometric fingerprinting as one of the 
one, one, one of the, the um, biometric. Yes, yes. Facial scan, yes, yes. So, so there are those who are, and I thought he was going to make that point. I'm not going to speak for him, but I've heard many express the view that fingerprinting creates some sort of um, discomfort since it seems more aligned with some sort of criminal, you know, activity. And therefore, there is some nervousness being expressed. I am the member of parliament for the Grand Bay constituency, and I'm from St. Joseph. There are concerns being raised about fingerprinting as one way of being registered to vote and being able to exercise the right to vote. We are listening to those concerns. There are views that there should be simply a photo identification as a way of identification, as is done with your passport or other identification, you know, cards. So that is one view, these are some views that are being expressed. We are not taking any firm position except to say we are very concerned about the, the possible use of fingerprinting as one of the biometric data that can be used for registration and for voting. But generally on the issue of voter ID card, the Dominican Liberal Party is in favor of some form of identification, but is not taking a position at this time as to whether it should be a national ID card or a singular use voter ID card. We are open to discussions, and the discussion will lead us to a position that we can take comfortably. There are two more items that I wish to speak to. One, I was sort of wondering whether I should raise it, um, but with some advice from the Dominican Labour Party leadership and um, our team, and also taking into account some of the views expressed, we believe it is important to speak to the transportation of voters. So Dennis on page 16 of his report speaks to some of the discussions around the transportation of voters. But the Dominican Labour Party is guided by the judgments of the highest elections courts of the Commonwealth of Dominica that the provision of transportation for voting is acceptable once it is procured, once it is sorry, not procured by bribery, treating, or undue influence. So essentially giving your neighbor a ride to the polling station is not illegal. Neither is offering a ride to your friend who lives in New York to come to Dominica to vote without some criminal intent, without undue influence, without bribery or treating as defined by law is legal. And it is important to express that the Dominican Labour Party supports that position. However, we are open to yet where the discussions will lead on in this matter. Finally, on election campaign financing, a lot has been said, especially by those of us who enjoy the largest of treasuries where these countries are able to print money. Unfortunately for us in Dominica, as part of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, we don't have that ability. And therefore, we are constrained by how much a treasury can make available to political parties. That notwithstanding, the Dominican Labour Party is open to discuss campaign financing. However, there are a number of questions which must be answered prior to embarking on any campaign financing legislation. For example, how much does each political party get? How do we define a political party? How many signatures would you require to ensure that you are in fact a political party for the purposes of campaign financing? How do we determine the amounts being given to each political party? How much does a campaign cost? And I mean, I don't need to, I don't want to criticize anybody, but you know, sometimes when we don't know about things, it's best we don't talk about them and go ask somebody who knows. But there are those who have perhaps never run a campaign for a political party. And they are excited about the whole idea of campaign financing. The question you should ask them is how much does it 
cost to even have one rally, far less to run an entire political campaign for season. So it is, these are some of the very important questions. Who is going to bear that cost? Are we going to limit private individual donations? How is that recorded? On who is the owner's place? That is to say, the individual, the candidate, the political party. All of those questions in the report, we have not seen enough answers to those fundamental questions in order to determine how we should proceed with campaign financing. However, the Dominican Labour Party remains committed to that process, and we are interested in having broad discussions on campaign financing. And we also have received indication by some of our regional organizations that they may be interested in proposing an OECS-wide and perhaps even a CARICOM-wide campaign financing legislation. We hope that we can be guided by both the OECS and the, Commonwealth Secretary, and the CARICOM Secretariat. And perhaps we can be assisted by the Commonwealth Secretariat and the OAS to seek to get answers to those questions. Are we going to tax our citizens in order to finance campaigns? How much is that going to be? How is it going to be levied? And all of these questions are valid questions that we must, we must seek answers to prior to embarking on any form of campaign financing. In conclusion, the Dominican Labour Party commends the government for this policy of widespread consultation. And as we have sought to do, we encourage discussions you notice for the last two nights, the political leader of the Dominican Labour Party has sat there quietly and observing. That is the spirit which we want to conduct the consultation moving through Dominica. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't even go that far because, like I said, before we even speak of political um, political parties. We must seek to get the definition of a political party. What is a political party in order to benefit from campaign financing? But yes, in fact, the other political leaders um, won't just address us um, virtually, and we're very happy that we can utilize the technology to have him join us, as we always do when we reach out to our, our voters in the diaspora, and we're very happy to engage with him, and we'll continue to have that level of engagement. And also, we, we just we wish our the other political leader well in South Sudan. I'm not sure if he has um, internet connection there, as he's not shown up on the screen as yet. So we are very open to, to the consultation, and we look forward to the reports from the observers as they sit and observe the conduct of these, these um, consultations throughout the length and breadth of Dominica. And finally, in the same spirit, we encourage the members of the other political parties to speak. Please, please, we urge you to express your views, express your positions on the Sir Dennis report. But please, do not substitute your lack of knowledge of the report for poetry and grandiose speeches. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Henderson. I would like to give the floor to Mr. Nicholas George. Thank you, Madam Chair. Minister and the observers who are among us tonight, and everybody else who is present in this room and listening via media. Uh, from the onset, ma'am, uh, I was almost ready to stipulate that um, everything that Honorable Vince Henderson said should form part of the record and would probably support it. Because he started by saying that um, 
He didn't want to be knee-jerkedly responding to anything coming from the opposition. So that was refreshing. But he did take some pot shots at the opposition. I will try my best not to do the same because I am not in parliament. Um, it's okay, parliament. I am not in parliament. But I, I, want to, I want to say tonight that the exercise that we're going through here in Dominica is a painful one. And that uh, it is seeking to reestablish trust, ethics, integrity, responsibility, and accountability in governance in Dominica. And as I, as I start, I want to draw reference to the preamble to Dominica's constitution that says, and, and that's where uh, Honorable Vincent Nelson and I probably agree, the right to vote. But the right to vote carries with it a responsibility. And when that responsibility is transferred to those who won at the poll, they must be reminded of the provisions of the Constitution, and particularly the preamble to the Constitution, because that is where everything is at. That's where the intention of the people is contained. Whatever section that says a president shall appoint a prime minister is down in the body. But when that appointment is made, the prime minister and any other person so appointed must return to the preamble, because it says, Whereas the people of Dominica have affirmed that the Commonwealth of Dominica is founded upon principles that acknowledge the supremacy of God, faith in fundamental human rights and freedoms, the position of the family in a society of free men and free institutions, the dignity of the human person, and the equal and inalienable rights with which all members of the human family were endowed by their creator, respect the principles of social justice, and therefore believe that the operation of the economic system should result in so distributing the material resources of the community as to subserve the common good, that there should be adequate means of livelihood for all, that labor and in this case here, I'm probably taking the advantage of saying that work should not be exploited <laughs> or forced by economic necessity to operate in inhumane conditions. But there should be the opportunity for advancement on the basis of recognition of merit, ability, and integrity. that have asserted their belief in a democratic society in which all persons may, to the extent of their capacity, play some part in the institutions of the national life and thus develop and maintain due respect for lawfully constituted authority. Recognize that men and institutions remain free only when freedom is founded upon respect for moral and spiritual values and the rule of law. Desire that their constitution should make provisions for ensuring the protection of the Commonwealth of Dominica of fundamental human rights and freedoms. The presupposition in that preamble is that as a citizenry, we must continually remember that we are endowed by our creator and we must accept him as the supreme creator. That social justice should be practiced in the discharge of everyone's responsibilities. That distributing resources of the community as to subserve the common good, this we spoke of a while ago, is at the heart of what an election will finally bring. It will bring 21 elected representatives to parliament, nine senators, an attorney general, and a speaker. That's what it brings. And the preamble 
the lecture, the instruction, the philosophy of the people of Dominica is that when we discharge our duties, it must be done in a godly fashion. And it must be done, the distribution of the economic goods of the country must be equitably distributed. Madam, the United Workers Party, on the Registration of Electors Act, stipulates that there should be a total re-registration of voters and provisions for cleansing the voters list annually. The current act, the Electors Act of Dominica currently allows for that to take place. Consistent with the Constitution, only those persons who are ordinarily resident in Dominica and those who are no longer ordinarily resident in Dominica for less than five years should be eligible to vote in our elections. There should be a specific voter ID card issued to all eligible voters in Dominica with biometric data including facial recognition and fingerprints. And I did allow a stipulation that uh, Honorable Vince Henderson's address should be in the records. But on this one here, he mentioned that uh, there's no evidence, there's never been any evidence of voter fraud. Um, he may be right. He may be right because the courts, however, the courts have never allow the hearing of petitions in Dominica. That's where the evidence is laid before the Supreme Court. And the last one, the petitions were not allowed because some constitutional stipulation. There should be no overseas registration of voters and no overseas confirmation of registration of voters. Initially, I said that this is an exercise on re-establishing trust, ethics, integrity, responsibility, and accountability in government. The Electoral Commission is part of that process. And we have not been able to trust the current electoral commission. We have on the record, we have on the record that a member of, a sitting member of the commission is, and probably still is, was, and probably still is, an attorney on record for sitting members in this government in a matter that was litigated before the court under the House of Assembly Act. Somebody need to explain to me if that is not conflict of interest, well, then what it is? We're talking elections and we're talking the composition of the Electoral Commission. Now trust that and it is this commission that has the power on the Sir Dennis's recommendation that they shall select the venues where re-registration and confirmation will be done overseas. That they shall select the people who will do the registration overseas, the confirmation of registration overseas. No. For that to happen, there must be confidence building measures in the legislation that ensures that whatever is done has a high sense of fairness in whatever it is presented. But as constituted now, we cannot trust that. Campaign finance reform. 
Yes, Honorable Henderson. You've heard plenty versions, and you will hear this one, and you will hear others. Provisions in the House of Assembly bill must be specific on all spending limits. There should be fixed limits on campaign finance financing, a maximum of $50 per registered voter. Expenditure both before and during any reporting period stipulated in the applicable legislation. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, I did promise myself that I would not make any idiotic, divisive, or uh, uh, denigrating statement that for fear that you might deem me to be imputing a proper motive. Uh, I didn't expect that I would be disturbed, but uh, Ambassador, well, Ambassador and Honorable Vince Anderson is my friend, and uh, so if I make a you know, I make this, uh, a comment. I would expect him to share water with me later. I mean, no, I mean. But um, I allow that to sink in because Dominica has 72,000 people. Um, I have been on this earth for a little number of years. And since I was in King, well, we didn't call it kindergarten at the time, we had another name for it in, in, in Colio. Uh, since then, I learned that we had 72,000. Right now, in 2023, we have 72,000, but the voters list is 74. Colio, and probably, let's take Vegas, Honorable Prime Minister, you probably have 3,000 electors in Vegas. Or St. Joseph? Yeah, All right. 3,000 voters at $50, at $50 per elector. Um, can you help me? Because I only did arithmetic in school. I didn't do math. So much is it? Uh, all right. The question is, in an economy as Dominica's, 26 million U.S. dollars being spent on an election is like spending the entire budget of the island. And the question is, what are you spending so much money on the election for? And even when you win, what do you do? Those who elect you, you don't respect them. So, in, in Cody's case, 600 people, 600 electors, that would be $18,000. And Robert Darren Pinard, if you were granted $18,000 in Colibu, are you willing to stand here and say that that would not be enough to campaign in an election in Colibu uh, against me against $18,000 as well? What else do you need? How much more money do you need? to convince the people in Colibu that you require more money. The definition of bribery must reflect the guidance of Halsbury's laws of England. And that um, this is where no one has been debated. And I want to add something because in the House of Assembly currently, I think section or standing order 72 provides for the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, even if I am not now a member of the House, I did work for the Speaker of the House, so I had an occasion to read through the, the standing orders. And I think it's 72, thereabouts. It says that there shall be a Public Accounts Committee. And that's it, and how it is composed. But we know, again, as far as ethics and integrity and accountability and responsibilities are concerned, the Public Accounts Committee has become ineffective. So accounting officers do not respond to the 
summonses or requests from the leader of the opposition to attend. Um, so I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Once the, the honorable prime, once the honorable prime minister engages me, I know I am doing well tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, fine. That, that's okay. That's fine. Just the engagement is fine. All right. In addition to all the draft bill, there should be an. Um, there is urgent need, Dominica, for the passage of a Parliamentary Public Accounts Committees Act. <laughs> elections, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, you asked if we use for elections. The answer is yes. Because elections do not end at the poll after five. Those who are elected need to continue and to conduct their affairs in a godly manner, with ethics, with integrity and accountability. And they go into the House of Assembly, where recently Prime Minister, you led, or Minister of Finance, you led the approval of the budget. And when that budget is being activated by the accounting officers, the director of audit by constitution must write in the, uh, the, the report and submit it and lay it before parliament. Well, we know that there have been delays. Okay, so sometimes the Public Accounts Committee has to deal with a report five years ago. So, I did, yes, so, no, you asked me if it is, so I'm saying, that elections do not end at the end of the polling day. It continues into the, hall, the halls of the House of Assembly. And we're seeking to amend the House of Assembly Act in those provisions. Madam Chair, with reference to um, access to the media, it is the position of the United Workers Party that there should be equal access to the media, state-owned and private. Again, every time I, every time I stop, I stop for effect. Um, we are talking about best practices, and there exists in our jurisdiction, in Antigua, such a provision. I'm not going to read it, but I leave it to you. Okay? Right. But there exists that provision in the Antigua Representation of the People's Act, the provisions for equal access to all media. I think by explanation, one might say, well, the state-owned, it has to be free, and the privately-owned, you may have to pay commercial rates. But you should not, there should not be discrimination in the public media. And the, the, I want to end by saying that we are here as if well, we are in a convent. We're not in a convent, a monastery, or seminary tonight. But we are doing solemn duty tonight. The things I speak of, the question of trust, is serious. We have had the election, the Electoral Commission of 2008 pronounced that they were going to reform the electoral process. And that was timed by a 2008 email. And it is that email that has us here now in 2023 trying to get reason. 
There is the issue of petitions, something that Honorable Henderson spoke about. The United Workers Party has petitioned the courts in 2005, 2009, 2014, 2019. And yes, the decisions have not come in the favor of the United Workers Party, but the petitions have been laid. But here is something. Having laid the petition, because the law requires that the petitions must be laid before the court within 21 days. Yet, the determination of the case, and in Dominica's particular case, and the Honorable Prime Minister is sitting here, we were told three years after his position, after an election was contested, three years after the petition was filed at the court, what the decision of the court was. The United Workers Party is recommending that the petition process must be laid, heard, and determined within 90 days. Because it is important for us to know who our elected officials are. And if it is contested in court, it must be done expeditiously. So, in the Petitions Act, we are asking, we are asking for that. And um, my good friend, the current chairman of the, the election commission is there. And I'm very glad that Sir Byron has found the courage to put before us an elections commission's view. I am hoping, sir, that if you are the chairman when that bill is passed, that you will adhere by what is contained in that bill. Because I saw the word integrity there in the discharge of the duties of members of the commission. I close by saying we are doing a solemn duty tonight. We are doing a godly duty tonight. And I'm not here to bash anyone. What I'm saying with all earnesty, this thing has taken too long to come to where we are. Because in 1976, the other um, Patrick John declared in Salisbury he wanted to take uh, Dominica to independence. And in 1978, that was a tale. And we had the Constitution ratified in our parliament in 1978, two years after the declaration. And it is that Constitution that we are conducting our affairs by currently. We can do well by this process that we're going through now, because it is akin to the Constitution. In our present democratic system, we cannot have a prime minister if we don't have an election process. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. George, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad that later in your presentation you corrected the statement because you, you had said that the courts have never allowed the hearing of election petitions in Dominica, and that was an incorrect statement. And as, as an attorney at law, I, I have to, I have to. Um, to raise that, but you, you did speak about um, decisions of the court in relation to some petitions that you would have um, brought before the court. Um, we, we, if we can perhaps go um, on to Mr. Johnson Boston and, um, and, and then Mr. Ferdinand. Um, we are running out of time, so I ask you to bear that in mind as well, and this other gentleman here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition, friends from 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think tonight we are in a position where we should allow soberness to take charge of this discussion going forward. We are on this road for over 13 years, and the region must be laughing at us that we cannot come to a conclusion on electoral reform for so long. And what I expected would have happened here tonight is for each party to present, based on the report and the draft legislation, what Sir Dennis Byron has presented. The attention I was called to give a review, and I guess the review was to direct us in that direction. I don't think it's an opportunity or occasion to take chip short at one another. I think we should be very sober when we're doing this. We should state what we in the resolution, in the report and draft resolution, what legislation, sorry, what we agree with and what we disagree with. What we can improve in take the process forward. And sometimes I find it public politics maybe a little indisciplined. And sometimes it gets carried away into all other areas. I have seen politics where you get heated discussion and there's a certain level of civility and comradery. And to me, I feel sometimes you come to occasion and it's they and them and so forth. And I think unless we can understand that and recognize what we want to do, because at the end of the day, we want to achieve a reform that is for Dominica. Remember now, reform is not a one-shot thing. It is a continuous process, a living activity. Somebody mentioned that um, you are taught property to vote more than the bank, you are taught um, house and land. They also said women could not vote. They could not vote. They had no right to vote. Women. And today we see the role women are playing. The young people had to wait until they were 21 to vote. And it was changed through reform to 18. So it's a continuous process. Now I disagree with um, Tony asked when he talked about looking for the, the way in which you qualify Dominicans overseas to vote. I mean, in this day and age, we talk about you send a barrier to your mother, you send a, a couple hundred dollars to your mother, is a right to vote. To me, I find we should be talking about how we organize our Dominicans abroad, if they're taking part in our election, one, to create markets where they are for produce or craft and our uh, agriculture and so forth, and two, make money available, the resources to the bank to online, come and build here, and so forth. We in the Freedom Party were earlier on able to articulate it quite well, what we agreed to. And I think we think the 90 days is an improvement over what we had. Because it says if you're out of state for five years uninterrupted, you ought not to be on the list of not to vote. And that have been for us over a period of time a very troubling and even vexing issue. And some people give the impression that if you raise this, you're against Dominicans who live abroad. No, we just want to ensure that the right thing is done because we are a country of the laws. Okay? So, so Dennis Barron, in what he had recommended, had given us a 50 or 90, and we felt the 90 days is an improvement for what we had in the old legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boston. Um, we would like to ask Mr. Charles, Charles uh, of Team Unity to share his um, perspectives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I even go into my few words, I just want to comment on the equal access of, of the radio stations. I, like, I would like to see that being offered to Team Unity when we share our press releases. I notice certain radio stations don't do that. <laughs> Regardless of that, thank you for the opportunity. Let me, on behalf of Team Unity Dominica, thank the Office of the Cabinet Secretary and the, of the Commonwealth of Dominica for the cordial, respectful, and professional manner in which they have engaged our team. 
by extension, I also wish to applaud the Chief Elections Officer, Ian Anthony, and his staff for, for the my team and I, the most cordial courtesies and support during the last general elections. I also thank the Honorable Prime Minister for his post-election engagement in which he appears to be wanting to move the process on. Thank you, sir. It is also good that the representatives of the OAS and the Commonwealth CARICOM and the OECS have been invited to this consultation because the gist of my presentation goes right back to the electoral observer mission of the OAS of Commonwealth of Dominica elections of December 6, 2019 and prior elections. The spirit of the deceased president, Nicholas Liverpool, I'm invoking his memory right now. His words echo through tonight's proceedings. He reminds us that the right to vote as a consequence, the, the right to determine which political party or group of persons is, is to govern the country during the next parliamentary term is the most important right of a democratic society. And this is why our team proudly contested the last election. We, however, contested knowing that we did not stand the chance of winning and that the results were a foregone conclusion. Even before a vote was cast, in fact, I wrote my concession speech before the day of the general election. But we decided to contest as a symbolic means, especially since it became apparent that some saw not contesting as a catalyst to strengthening our democracy. I think they were wrong. Yes, sir. Reform is both political and legal, and the political must take place before the legal. Today, you have invited the politicians to come and discuss a legal draft and I suppose as a symbolic gesture or just an exercise. But had he been there today, the deceased Ruthie Douglas, former Prime Minister of Dominica, might have said that this process is duvadeye, they put in the cap before the horse. And nothing much will come out of it. Yes, we need a bill to go to cabinet, to parliament, sorry, in order to make the reform proposal law. But what happened to all of the recommendations that were made prior to these draft regulations of the election bills 2023 and the draft registration of election bill 2023? What happened to those? I was impressed by the contributions of the lawyers, particularly Attorney Gildan Richards at last night's public consultation. Even if Honorable Attorney General appeared to dance around the, the matter of residency. But in our view, residency is quite simple. It means to reside and the ability to vote is a residency issue. So Dennis Byron in 71C of the Proposed Regulations of the Election Act proposes that what can be concluded as a mild treatment to what is necessary as far as cleansing of the elections is concerned. Again, I heard the AG referring to the proposed bill as an act at last evening's presentation, but he corrected himself. It's, it's a bit concerning, but I, I must, I'm almost um, moved to ask, is this a real consultation? Residency is the currency of voting. This means that one must be a citizen and may not unnecessarily be qualified to vote. This has been and continued to be a standard practice with elections and electoral laws worldwide. Let us not reinvent the wheel. Every Dominican citizen who resides in the area which they intend to vote should vote using their voting identification, voter ID not a national ID that every citizen can or should have. The most glaring and vexing point of reform is a bloated list of electors, which is more than Dominica's current population. Sadly, 
the proposed draft regulation only makes this worse. It's painfully obvious that the best first step is to cleanse the list. Why is this so difficult? It is not a legal matter. It is mere common sense. Even an infant will understand. Our view on re-registration which aligns with the overwhelming majority of Dominica is very simple. Cleanse the list. That's it. Give Ian and his staff some money and additional personnel to do a national survey. They will find out who is currently residing on island. Keep them on the list of electors. Remove the names of those who have died. Remove the names of those who have died. And Dominicans who do not currently reside on island based on the standing electoral laws. Those names will be cleansed. We'll sim those names who have been cleansed will simply register when they return to reside for 50, 60, 90 days as a proposed in the draft bill. That is it. This is the first necessary step. This has to be the way, for no other way will seem fair. And that is right for our democracy. No party or resident will be disenfranchised, and there will be no more fighting over reform. And well, not to the extent as we're currently being seen. When this is done, the most integral aspect of voting is achieved. We vote for parties, but reform to protect our democracy. Reform, therefore, cannot be a party thing. Reform is the most significant exercise in the life of a democracy. That is why I do not agree with those who say that the electoral apparatus has worked well since independence as a means of downplaying electoral reform. Constant reform is necessary if democracy is to thrive. Regular reform of the voting processes must be continuous in order that the integrity of the vote is maintained. To ask politicians to comment on a legal draft which appears to have been submitted in favor of one political party is a bit jarring. If all parties offered ideas, why is the bill and act as an AG suggested, seemingly to favor the views of one set. It is a worrying feeling about this report and the spirit in which it was done. The draft bill which stems on Sir Byron's work ought not to be dismissed, but we need to pull the brakes on its passage. Now that we are all here, let us consider every party's views. If this bill, aspects of it becomes law, it could, this could be the ratification of one set's will and legacy that is being said. This bill should be redesigned as to reflect the wishes of our brothers and sisters of the UWP, the DFP, TMD, and others, and especially the overwhelming views of, of the majority people. Let us not force our country into a situation where the electoral will of the people is controlled by this proposed draft regulation bill 2023 and draft registration of electors bill 2023. They are all matters which must be addressed if every modernization is going to be made. Let us do the basics right and erect a strong foundation before we build on the election infrastructure. I propose that a committee be formed to include those of us who have contributed to tonight's consultation to facilitate ongoing discussion and further recommend that this bill should undergo the necessary consultative oversight. Today's consultation should not give a green light for the passage of any act. This bill is simply not ready for Parliament, and to do so would be ill-advised. I thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I believe that um, in relation, I don't know if the AG wants to speak to the, to the act of bill, but um, as, you, as you would know, what has been proposed by Sir, Sir Dennis is, it's proposed legislation, so I, I don't know if it's, if, if it's, we can even call it a bill, but it's proposed legislation that he has put forward. 
and I don't think it has been um, endorsed. I don't think the government has expressed its opinion on it. Um, but thank you very much for your, for your contributions, and I would like to ask um, Minister Laville to take the floor. Good evening, Honorable Prime Minister, Opposition Leader, um, Madam Chair, AG, esteemed observers, and uh, all participants. Um, pleasant evening to all of you. Um, I recognize we've been here for a long time, but there are a few issues that I would like to touch on quite um, briefly. Um, first of all, it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here as part of this electoral reform process. Um, and I, I really do hope, in fact, that the purpose of all of us here in this consultation is to help to build a stronger and more robust democracy. Um, and it is because of this, and this is in fact our intention, and the reason why the submissions from uh, the Dominica Freedom Party, for example, and the opposition um, to institute a special committee to further advance this process, we in fact vehemently opposed to that. Because what is happening here is really a consultation. And it's a, it's a wide process of consultation where we're engaging various groups, political parties, interest groups, the clergy, and so on. And this process allows us to have the respective viewpoints from a wider cross-section of our population. And we therefore do not believe in, in limiting the consultation to just a few people. If I were to ask the question to the Freedom Party, how would we go about selecting that special committee for making the decisions on behalf of the people? Would it be one representative from that specific party, or the lawyers, or the churches? Like, what is the method? How do we gather various interests of all of the people across Dominica? And hence the reason why we, we are grateful so far with the participation in this process and the fact that some of the considerations really included a survey of what Dominicans um, would like to see in the advancements of, of this electoral process. And what that in fact does by engaging the white cross section is that we do not have skewed viewpoints at the end of the process. So I embrace the way the method in which we have been approaching this. As it relates to a fixed date that has been proposed for the election, as far as I am aware, when I, I last checked, the scope of Sir Byron's um, assignment did not, in fact, include constitutional amendments. Um, so while I am, in fact, aware that we have had in our history constitutional amendments, that was not part of Sir Dennis's scope. And we should never seek to come here and in any way trivialize the process in which we go about amending the Constitution in any way. It is not a simple, simplistic method. It is one where, for example, if we look at one of the advanced countries like the United States, the 27th Amendment of their Constitution took 203 years. The process was first initiated in 1789, and it went dead. It was only revived in the 1980s, and then, in fact, ratified in 1992. Again, I'm not suggesting that here in Dominica it will take 203 years to have the ratification um, of any amendment, but I'm thereby proposing and submitting that it's a very serious process, and we should never seek to casually submit the process of amending the con Constitution as something that is very simple and simplistic. Um, as it relates to the process, it's, it's very involved, and it is one in some cases, as proposed by senior counsel, it may in fact get to the point where a referendum is needed, where the voice of every single Dominican who is qualified to vote on this matter may need to have their say. And if we are, we are truly serious about the, uh, the process of advancing um, electoral reform, we must ask ourselves, um, do we want to proceed with the continuation of this consultation as it relates to electoral reform in its strict sense, or do we want to go further in a process that can really be protracted? So these are some questions that I submit for consideration. Um, as it relates to the imposition of the requirement of 50 to 90 days 
as it relates to uh, the residency required on aggregate to be here in Dominica. Um, it is something that we, we must ask ourselves. Um, what is our current electoral system based on? What is it predicated on? And as far as I'm aware, it's based on universal suffrage. And if that is the case, um, as it is right now, we must ask ourselves, truly, the imposition of this requirement, does it align with the principles of universal suffrage? And that is something we must really, in, in, in fact, truly reflect upon. In most advanced countries with even more modern, modernized electoral systems, many of the amendments that are made by way of the electoral uh, systems are, in fact, aligned with expanding um, the, the rights to vote and protecting people's rights to vote and not in any way limiting that right. So it is something we must really ask ourselves also. If we are interested in modernizing and reforming our process, what are we in fact proposing to align with international standards? Also, uh, two, um, I, I am pleased that Team Unity did in fact uh, praise the DLP and in fact the Prime Minister for speaking honestly as it relates to our history um, and the chronology of our proposals for supporting electoral reform. And this dates back to February of 2011. And time and time again, we have proposed areas for reform. And that has been our chapter record, in fact. And uh, we have been consistent with that. Um, so I am happy that we are advancing right now with this process. Um, I heard a submission that registered voters should be charged uh, $50 for uh, campaign financing. And um, I, I must say, in fact, that um, I was baffled to hear that because, again, if we go back to the principles of universal suffrage, again, then really, in fact, we must ask ourselves, uh, are we making it more difficult, in fact, for people to participate in the process by imposing a charge of $50? If I would have asked myself, where was I when I was 18 years, and um, I would in fact have been a college student, and I would have been so excited to register and take part in the electoral process, and $50 for me at that time would be as scarce as gold, and I remember how excited I was to participate in the electoral process. So that imposition on our fifth formers and our high school students and our college students and our pensioners in Dominica, those on social security, those living with disabilities, um, we must seriously ask ourselves, what are we asking um, the, the population and our re registered voters to participate in? And uh, while I also must again congratulate Team Unity for taking part um, in the political process most recently, um, we would hear clearly um, that they said their participation was symbolic. And uh, while I commend them for participating in the process, we must note the word symbolism, okay? And here we can tie this and correlate it to ca campaign financing also too. Many people have various ideologies. There are some parties that are absolutely serious, like the Dominica Labour Party. And there are those, for various reasons, have their various ideologies that um, I, I will not address. But some of them, it may be for symbolism. Then here it is, we are asking, and while they did not propose that, um, it was proposed by, a, by, by um, a representative from another political party. But are we going to, in fact, charge our people or expect our registered voters to subscribe to and finance parties who are putting themselves forward merely for symbolism? And these are the things that we have to critically ask ourselves. Um, why uh, should our registered voters be required to finance parties? And, 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 and what is expected of these, these various parties? Um, there was an assertion that was made to $26 million by the DL, DLP to finance one of our elections. And uh, you know, um, this, this is something that we have to be careful about, um, just merely hurling numbers around, um, and I, I must seek to, to clarify these decisions. 
And some of you all may argue that this was in a report. Um, we must reference when reports are being created and compiled. We must reference. And um, if we cannot reference adequately and correctly, then really, in fact, you must then question these numbers that are being held around. Um, I have a lot more to say, but I recognize that it is late, so I, I will end at this point. But I really just want to thank all of you for participating in this very important process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, we are um, running out of time. I think we've run out of time already, but I, I want to give the opportunity to um, one of our independent candidates to address us. Um, he's Tyrone Nicholas. Tyrone Nicholas. Yes. Good night, everybody. My name is Tyrone Nicholas, independent candidate representing Eurozone of Constituency. And I was in. Um, I wasn't too keen on coming here, you know, but um, I was encouraged by a, a police officer who, um, incidentally, at the time, was giving me a ticket. <laughs> yeah, well. So, <laughs> tonight, well, I had to ask his opinion, you know, because I was wrestling with it, whether I should come or not. Um, I know that it is a, it is not an insurmountable, insurmountable task, but it is a challenging task, never, no less, to be here and to share my, my views unadulterated with um, the political directorate of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Tonight, I have accepted this invitation to share my views on the subject matter before us. And in so doing, I have also been occasioned the opportunity to assert the tenets and principles and values of, of my constitution, the Dominican constitution. And so I hope to share in the, the pure sense my sentiments on the unfolded events that have led us to this forum where we are to debate the flaws and merits of these recommendations. To begin, we have had many recommendations along the way, put forward by various civic organizations, regional and international election, election observers, as well as civic-minded civic local professionals, all of which have went unimplemented and basically shelved. Perhaps due to a lack of consideration or um, a lack of budgetary allocations to the Electoral Commission. Uh, in Mr. Barrett's own words, he said that reform is a continuing incremental process. And I, I highlight the word incremental because um, we have found ourselves here seemingly in a haste to enact sweeping legislations. We propose all of this while even the most rudimentary and fundamental process of maintaining a clean voters, voters list has been laid directly by the responsible authority. As the CCJ cited, uh, there are apparent instances of non-compliance to electoral law and process in Dominica meaning that although legislation exists mandating the execution of these basic functions, these laws have not been enforced. While we are aspiring to build geothermal plants and international airports, we seem or we appear to be unable to the point of disability to update a, a simple list in a time when we are afforded the most advanced technological solutions at the most reasonable costs, but this still remains under. I propose this to every listening ear that no amount of legislation will be equal to the enforcement of the law. 
we would be naive to seek a remedy to enforcement by simply passing additional legislation. I would propose that without the provision of robust, robust financial and techno technical resources to the constitutionally prescribed agency, which is the Electoral Commission, there will be a continued absence of enforcement for any legislation, whether new or old. And in keeping with my preceding observations, let me register my first objection. I believe that it is revealing of the modus operandi with, within state affairs to have received this invitation to consult on electoral reform from the office of the Prime Minister. I would have expected such an invitation to be extended from the impartial and constitutional office of the Electoral Commission. At least that would have been a better attempt at presenting this manipulation. Had ample funds been made available to the Electoral Commission, which would then, on its own volition, initiate consultations with Mr. Byron, and then go on to invite stakeholders such as myself to consult, but alas, this route was, this route, as framed within the halls of West, Westminster, I believe, with the intention of removing all doubt as to the impartiality of the process, which would then support, support people's trust in the process, it did not meet the, the satisfaction of the deal. It really does appear that the letter head of the office of the Prime Minister is now a rubber stamp that is used to run everything. <laughs> in my opinion, this is uh, indica indicative of a uh, continued penchant of the DLP leadership to sideline constitutionally, constitutionally prescribed authority in the pursuit of preferred alternatives. But what is more, even more egregious is the telling lack of initiative and responsibility on the part of the electoral, the electoral Commission, which as an institution has proven to be as useful as the non-existent Parliamentary Commission in every instance. But not only in the sanitization and upkeep of the electoral list, but also in debating the merit of independent observations and recommendations and in pressing the government for financing within the national budget. All of this in order to raise awareness towards the merit, as uh, Byron highlighted, and the, the incremental implementation of these independent recommendations, which are, are, are mostly free from political tint, objective, and in alignment with international best practices. The duties that are constitutionally endowed upon the chair of the Electoral Commission, in my opinion, has been relegated to oblivion. The salient question right now then would be to ask, do these alternatives which are being presented here serve the interests of the general population and future generations of unborn Dominicans? Or does it serve to ensure the security and entrenchment of a political ideology that has fractured and entrenched our nation in 20 plus years of tribalism? Will we be creating a foundation upon which future ideas for advancement can take root? Or are we institutionalizing and cementing ourselves into the current situations which we live. Situations that stifle our creativity, limit our advancement, and restricts the palette with which we are to live expressive, colorful, and fulfilling life experiences. Will we or our grandchildren, or our children or our grandchildren have the ability to disagree and live in peace and tolerance? Will they have the ability to change their mind 
when an idea or an institution no longer serves and protects them. Many here appear certain that they have the answers, but from one paradigm to the next, <clears throat> history demonstrates to us that wherever human potential, ideas, and creativity are subdued by political preference, dogmatic belief, and ideology, chaos later ensues. These lessons instruct us that we must be guided in our approach, not by our own personal persuasions, but by a thirst for inclusivity and a sincere altruistic desire. This is the ultimate goal as these immortal instruments that we forge through debate and consensus will outlive us and go on to shape the outcomes of the lives and efforts of Dominicans who are not yet born. It is through, it is through thorough debate of the facts and information surrounding any subject that we can be led to a higher understanding, collective enlightenment, and above all, above all, at the individual level to earn the trust of the wider society and the respect of our peers. This is the prestige and the pinnacle of achievements that any man or woman can hope to attain, to be trusted, respected, and be beloved by his or her people. I wish to set the next few observations against the backdrop of the lack of a Freedom of Information Act in Dominica at present. In an era when all decision making is based on, actuate, on accurate and factual information, we are consistently being asked as Dominicans to act on faith. We are being told that we should not demand information that can be scrutinized and stand up to objective criticisms. But instead, we should place our trust, we are being told that we should pl place our trust in titles such as honorable and luminary. Most decisions to be making today requires information or data, you know, from, from personal, business, corporate, investor, uh, even the incumbent acknowledges the power of information. Yet, there has been no mention of the implementation of the Freedom of Information Act in Dominica in the past 20 years. This act would allow for the proper vetting and circulation of information and the opportunity for raw data to be exposed to different perspectives or interpretations and in so doing, eliminate potential bias. How was the information for this survey sourced and collected? What form were the questions? What tools were used? Were the questions prompting or leading? Where is the data? How were the participants and sample populations chosen? Can we, confident, can we confidently say right now that we have factual, trusted, and impartial information? Can we say that 600 plus locals is a good representation for the general population of Dominica? When our esteemed consultant goes on to use these findings as a basis pointing to a majority of Dominicans preferring a multi-purpose national ID card as opposed to a voter ID card. Just like we are being asked every five years to place our trust and confidence in individuals running for office, we are now being asked to place our trust in one man's inter interpretation of the statistics. Brothers and sisters, our trust cannot be so cheap. For less, we have surrendered our trust to people who hold the office and title of honorable. But do they, re but they, do they reciprocate that trust and confidence to us? Do they honor our trust by delivering the truth? Do they treat us with the dignity and respect that we deserve? Their behaviors demonstrate to us that by their estimations, we cannot be trusted with the truth for their own sake. 
In the age of technology, whoever controls information controls our decisions. So we must challenge every piece of information that we receive in the absence of reliable, unbiased, and accurate data so that facts may be distilled from fiction. Some of the very people who refuse to speak are witnessing the reality facing us. Visa restrictions being imposed, imposed on us, allegations around with the sale of state plans, the castration of the IPO and cost countless other occurrences result in the hemorrhaging of trust in authority. And as this chasm grows between the public and those in, a co in authority, so does it fuel the continued socio-economic decay of our communities and our families. While we grasp for the truth, we remain paralyzed to act because by various means we are kept in the dark. We pay twice for the lack of knowing, once when we are misled and again when we are belittled and denigrated for not knowing. <laughs> this is clear to brothers and sisters. The power of information is clear to those brothers and sisters who wait in limbo for a title and the authorization by their beloved government to move forward as independent people with home ownership. This long, uh, long standing lack of information, empowerment, and action indicates to us that there is something that someone does not want us to know. Because with knowledge becomes the power to redefine our circumstances as opposed to being led off into the unknown through the abuse of our ignorance. I invite my brothers and sisters to listen carefully to those among us who, who talk about reform, yet do not entertain the idea of institutional reform. They do not adhere to the tenets of the constitution of their own organizations. They do not heartily entertain the idea of electoral reform. Of electoral reform. Generations of our politicians who have not entertained, not implemented the oversight of an impartial parliamentary commissioner since 1978, breaking every rule in the, con in the book, even the constitution itself. And now they have arrived at the con conclusion that the constitution as it is, is not fit for purpose. They call our constitution a relic, a remnant of colonial rule, as an excuse to resign themselves and us by extension to being governed, governed by a perceived aristocracy. While we, the proletariat, descend into squalor and savagery. Those who present themselves as a new monarchy use their political will to now pull, push us towards the institutionalization of neo-colonialism neo with the lion's share of our state resources being held outside of our control. Last paragraph. <laughs> they have failed and continue to fail miserably because of their refusal to adhere to the prescription of the law. And now are attempting to subvert our constitution with our help with calls for reforms. I want reforms. But in order for me to be confident in those, those reforms, I must be thoroughly convinced that its implementers truly have the best interests of my island and all of my countrymen and Dominica at heart. Let me also say that although I may object to the unconstitutional nature of this engagement, it does not lessen my appreciation for the efforts of those within the legal fraternity and other civic and political groups who religiously put forward their effort to seek out the pitfalls and merits, if any, within, my, within Mr. Byron's drafts and recommendations so that we can be afforded, you know, an alternative that can serve us as a nation. It is clear by the utterances and behaviors of those who are in the perceived majority that we are thought of as idiots who always need to be instructed as to the time of day. And that perceived minority 
are powerless to implement the changes that we request unless we have their approval and blessings. So I appreciate your efforts, Mrs. Dede and others. I appreciate your efforts towards a solution against all odds. Thank you for the opportunity to express my sentiments this evening and may God watch over our country and of all of our people. Thank you and good night. Thank you folks. Um, we'll just have one last contribution tonight. Um, please bear in mind that if you have additional comments that you would want to um, bring forward, you can always submit that to the cabinet secretary. Uh, um, I would just invite the political leader of the Dominican Labour Party to address us, Prime Minister. Thank you. I am very careful what I say because I, I am also the, the leader of the, of the parliament uh, where we will eventually have to take the legislation uh, to be enacted. But just to say that we are engaging stakeholders with the greatest of sincerity. I have said on many occasions that we want this process to come to a conclusion so that we can engage ourselves on other equally important matters confronting our country's economic and social development. The, everyone has, has been given an opportunity to speak freely, um, whether you represent yourself or you represent an organization. And I believe that in itself is a clear manifestation of the sincerity, the honesty, and the integrity of the government in its engagement with stakeholders. In many countries, such processes have gone through with absolutely no consultation with the various pockets. Parliamentary committees meet, they discuss among themselves, they take it to Parliament, is is enacted, and that becomes law. And so the engagement that we are having is a very sincere one. There has been a process of consultation by Sir Dennis. And I want to also reiterate that the report of Sir Dennis with the accompanying draft legislation is Sir Dennis's report. It is not my report. It is not the report of the government. We were consulted like every other stakeholder as in so far as the political party is concerned in the, in the engagement by Sir Dennis throughout the several months of consultation. While the Constitution and the laws allow the Prime Minister to appoint uh, such engagement, I delegated the coordination of the of Sudanese's mandate to the Electoral Commission. As a matter of fact, the final report which Sudanese submitted, and prior to that, the draft reports were in the hands of others before it became it, became, um, it came to me. Uh, it was submitted to me by Sudan. So it, it tells you to, to the extent to which other stakeholders were engaged by Sudan during this process. What I want to say to us tonight is that it is okay and it is fine to make emotive comments and statements, and emotional ones. What I want to say to us sincerely, and I say so with the greatest sense of sincerity, that it is incumbent upon each of us individually and especially if we're representing people, to read the report and to read the draft legislation. Because when we have legislation, we must also preoccupy ourselves with the operationalization of the legislation. How do we translate what is in words and in law in real practice? And I'm saying to political organizations that we have to pay particular attention, for example, if you look at the issue of campaign financing, you recognize that the thought process of the drafters is incomplete. Because there are many 
gaps that one would have to look and pay attention to in order for it to achieve the desired objectives of the drafters of, of this legislation. And political organizations and independent candidates, especially, need to pay particular attention to the impositions of the law and the requirements of political organizations and individuals who are putting themselves for public office. The extraordinary bureaucracy is imposing on political organizations and parties in respect to the draft legislation in there. Now, there may be political parties like ours, like mine, that may have the structure, the organization, to answer this and to be conf in conformity with this. But the reality is that the many individuals, including my, my former student, Mr. Uh, Nicholas, who spoke earlier, and that's why he sounds so bright, his articulation. I, 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 I taught him the English language. Uh, and, and, and so he's even better than a, uh, than a thesaurus in his use of language. <laughs> um, we have to look at this, read it, and let us debate and discuss the report. Because if we are just being emotive, we will find ourselves going in circles. So what is it in the report that we do not want? What is it in the draft legislation that we think is appropriate or is not appropriate? And I'm saying to us, when you read the legislation, it is not it is missing it is it is still it is still engaging because what the drafters are proposing is something groundbreaking for dominica and indeed the oecs and so there is no legislation that one could look at in our jurisdiction to fashion the legislation on and therefore they leave it to us the dominican public to determine what eventually we want to take to Parliament that we feel would be appropriate to our culture, our nuances, and our circumstances. And so we have to read the legislation very carefully. There are people who, are, who have ideological and philosophical views about these things. But we have to be careful when we legislate in philosophy and ideology. Because it has to be a pragmatic and practical operation of the law and whether we are in a position and the resources that you're going to need insofar as the Electoral Commission is concerned. The law doesn't speak about this new structure. It talks about the, the, the membership of the, of the Commission. But what structure you're going to need, administrative structure you're going to need to ensure that the obligations set forth in the law or on the Commission can be properly implemented. And so these are things that we have to pay attention to. And in respect to campaign financing, Philosophically, we are not opposed to it as a party. We think it is an aspirational thing to be engaged upon. But you have to look at how do you implement it in Dominica. What, 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 is it, what, is the, what, is, what the legislation will contain that will, that will cause it to make sense and, and, and allow it to be able to be implemented in Dominica. The issue of the residency, and Honorable Dr. Henderson, spoke to this on behalf of the party. Very, very well I'm said. But let's look at the Caribbean context. Our citizens in the quote-unquote diaspora or overseas in North America and Europe, many of them have to, to survive, have to engage themselves in two jobs. The majority of them Caribbean nationals. Oh, um, if they work in one place, double shape. So you see them as a maintenance man in the, in the daytime and security at night. And, and when you place this 90-day this requirement of residency for them, on them, to exercise a franchise that many people die to achieve and to earn in Dominica, they may not have been in the bloodshed, but people would deny it from an economic standpoint. To, to, to be able to vote in Dominica back in the days, you have to own land. And, and, and so, 90 days. Are we saying, uh, are we, are we saying that, that we accept that for you to vote in Dominica as a Dominican university, that you must be, you must be resident in Dominica for 90 days over the 50, over the five um, year period, just to vote? There are people with green card holders. It requires
requires you to be resident in the United States if you're going to go the route of your citizenship. But it says you have to be there every six months. That's why Dominicans and Caribbean nationals who do not want to go and reside completely in the United States take the chance of being out of America for just for six months and sometimes they have to run to St. Croix or run to Miami just to send the passport to come back next day to keep the requirement and so forth. But for voting purposes, is it something that we believe will enhance the electoral processes in Dominica? So I'm putting these questions to us in terms of our engagement in the consultation because we need to arrive at a conclusion. We need to agree and have consensus about what are the five critical elements of the reform that we need to agree on and advance. There may be other things that we have to do tomorrow or next year or, or time of going back. But to, and I, the other thing I want to caution us against is the idea of bringing into play constitutional amendments. Those of us who are saying that it's been 13 years, we've been asking for this. Constitutional amendments, and we've seen the history in the Caribbean. There are many countries in the Caribbean cannot get to the CCJ as their, as their final court because they have to go through a referendum. And some of them have tried it and they failed on, on the CCJ. And so, can we not achieve, and it's a question, can we not achieve our desired objectives within the current framing and provisions of our constitution. And so these are the kind of questions I think we need to ask ourselves. The issue of identification cards um, and the requirement of fingerprinting. Mr. German, an independent candidate in the last election, raised a question. And the question is to us, do we think that there will be a material benefit in imposing the requirement of a fingerprinting for the purposes of voting in Dominic? The police cannot just watch you and tell you I want your fingerprint in Dominic. Your fingerprint will only be, be taken from you after you've been charged and you have to be processed. And why do we want to make it look like, do we really want to make it look like it is almost a criminal offense? to get, to be registered, to get an ID card to vote. So I'm putting this question to us, not in any definitive manner, but these are the, I believe, these are the fundamental questions that we have to ask ourselves in order for us to arrive at. And so we need to narrow the discussion to what are the critical points that we need to engage ourselves on, and so forth. And, and so I want to say to us, finally, because it's late, I want to say to you, my dear friend, that people can make a comment about integrity and truth and trust and all these things. That's fine. That's all part of, the, of democracy. We are free to see what, what, what is true or not. But I can say to the whole of my country that with the great sense of sincerity, we would like, I certainly would like to see this matter come to a conclusion and we move forward with other things. But for, for us to arrive at a conclusion through this consultation, we must not come and read. Reading poetry and prose are fine. Are fine, but the reality is we have documents before us. And just to say to you how serious we are in the engagement, I received the doc these documents, say, on June 10. By June 12, it was in the hands of the Dominican public. I hadn't even had a chance to read it myself. And I placed it in the hands of the Dominican public within 40 hours of re receiving it. And it is available for every Dominican to read. But read, we must. Reading this can be a very difficult thing. But we have to take our time and read this. And those who are assisting us in the preparation of our comment must do so from a vantage point of having read the document. And we must not seek to use this occasion to extend chip shots at me or my colleagues or the government. That's not going to help us. It's not going to help us arrive at a conclusion, my dear friends. What is going to cause us to arrive at a conclusion is us making reference, like you in a committee stage in the parliament, looking at legislation and say, look at section 
if we go to to the um, the, 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 the section on campaign reform, let us go to section 73. 73 one. Every political party shall on or before the first day of April in every year prepare and submit to the commission for the preceding financial year of that political party. And it goes 73-1A and 71-B. And so in respect to the demands on political parties, not only during election time, my dear former Freedom Party colleague, um, um, Boston, it is not only during election time, but it's going to place a demand on political parties throughout your existence. It requires you to submit audited financial statements. How are we going to finance the audited statements to pay the auditors who charge huge fees sometimes? And then when the political parties are charging three times more, how are you going to pay this as a political party? And how, if you, if you put in a limit on how much I can raise, then the question is, how much is the treasury going to give to me? Is the treasury, are we saying in Dominica that the treasury is going to have to provide financing to political parties and, and candidates at the elections? It is silent on that. It says nothing on that. And if we're to reference countries where you have such legislation, all of the United States of America, which is usually our, 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 our reference point, the Treasury of the United States will provide you financing if you choose to accept the limit that they place on you. If you do not choose to accept the limit and accept monies from the Treasury, you can raise a billion dollars as, as Obama did in his first um, run as, as, as a candidate. So we're not opposed to campaign financing, but we in Dominica, we must be objective and understand that certain nuances, cultural practices and norms, and the way our political parties are structured. For all political parties, the large measure in Dominica are voluntary organizations. But the law is going to place on you certain staff that you must have, certain legal requirements and documents that you must submit. And the question is, where would Todd get the monies from to employ an executive secretary or an accountant or a, a, a clerk to ensure that you, 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 you conform to the provisions of the law and the positions of the law? And so let us not be emotional about these things. This is a time for, for, for serious engagement, um, looking at the country. Do not look at what you think has caused Kerry to win all those elections and let us see whether we can cross them out as a reform exercise. No. And that's not what it has to be about the country and what we believe as political leaders, as individuals, as organizations to be in the best interest of Dominica now, Dominica tomorrow, and Dominica forever. And so finally, my dear my brothers and sisters, I want you to leave here tonight with the understanding and appreciation in a factual and sincere manner that we're here to engage you constructively, earnestly, honestly, transparently, as we seek to bring this vaccine matter of electoral reform to an end in Dominica, to the benefit of all people in Dominica. And the question is, to each of us, each of us must ask ourselves an introspective question. What is going to be my contribution to this? And how will history record my engagement in this consultation and my engagement to arriving at what we believe in our cultural circumstance, in our economic and financial and fiscal um, space, that is the real electoral reform that we can offer the people of Dominica at this time. It's a process. We'll continue to engage. And as time goes by, new things may come up. But we must never, as as, as Karanago people, as, as, as black people, as, as white people, as indigenous people must never appear to be engaging ourselves with a spirit and an intent of disenfranchising people of a fundamental right. Because what we talk about, we have to elect the government of the people. And how do we elect the government of the people? By ensuring that those who the constitution gives the right to vote must not be deterred from exercising that right by certain provisions in our laws. 
and we must, we, must, we must ask ourselves, so if we want to engage ourselves in a continuous battle and engagement, it's not going to help the country. It's not going to help the country. If we are honest with ourselves and we are sincere about this, we must not keep shifting the goalposts, my dear brothers and sisters. Let us, be, let us read the document. Some of you, I still see it new as I gave it to you last time in June. Let us read it. Let us write in it. Let us, let us check it up. And then send us what you have. You don't have, you don't have to send us what you have. So we can look at it. And, and, and the drafters can look at it. And to, to look at it in, in legal language. But we must not, we must look at our nuances, our cultural um, circumstances, our norms in Dominica, and to determine that we have to define an electoral reform exercise that suits our circumstance in these times. And let us not be emotive over this thing. So, and don't look to, I want to say to, to people, when you're talking about these things, disabuse your mind about Roosevelt's character and a focus on Roosevelt's character. I am not Dominica. I'm a citizen of Dominica. And this is always my home. But I'm not Dominica. Focus on Dominica. And what you believe that you want for Dominica. But not focus on how do I get rid of Roosevelt Skerritt as the Prime Minister of Dominica. If you do that, you will not win. Because the people of Dominica will determine that at the appropriate time. So but let's focus on what we have to do here. Let us, let us, let us, let us behave as if, let us behave the same way we behave the days after Hurricane Maria. Where we all work together to clear the roads and to clear the streets and rebuild homes and light the roads. And I'm sure if we reflect on the days after Maria, then that will bring a certain level of consciousness to ourselves, a soberness to our discussion, so we can arrive at some comprehensive conclusions to take to Parliament as quickly as possible. And so that, because my, my hope and my desire as a leader of the country, because I'm here speaking as a leader of the country, not as a leader of the political party, I dedicated to um, Dr. Henderson and um, Honorable Lamy to speak to on behalf of the party. I would like for us to usher in 2024 with a greater sense of unity in this country. To get rid of what we believe has caused us to be in an inter internecine type of relationship. And usher in 2024 with new legislation, a new system of electoral process, and allow the Commission with all of the resources that it requires to advance um, the implementation of the reform as approved, as recommended by Pluto Dominica and approved by the Parliament of Dominica. Let us give ourselves that target. But the only way we can get this is by making, looking at this. Inflammatory statements, all those things. When we get to political campaign, we can talk about those things. So let us save the political speeches um, for the next election. I think we have to advance it. <laughs> you know, let us hold it back um, and let us focus on the report that Sir Dennis has, has submitted to us and let's make reference to specific pages, specific paragraphs, specific clauses, specific sections and subsections and, 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 and so forth. I don't get into the section stuff because that ties the tongue of many lawyers in our legal. But seriously, my dear friends, let us focus on the report of Sir Dennis. What is that we like? I can tell you with the greatest sense of honesty. There are many things in this, in this report I do not support. And there are many things I support. And I'm writing as I go along and critiquing this report, page by page, paragraph by paragraph. And I, I indicate where, where, which, which, which things I support and I don't support. So that when I share this, you know, we can see whether we can can form part of the final document that goes to the parliament. So I try not to give my views on what I agree with and what I don't agree with. I don't want to prejudice the minds of anybody. I want Dominicans to be free, irrespective of political persuasion, to express your views from within yourself in the greatest sense of honesty, having read the document. But being, being emotive and, 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 and not making reference to the document at this stage, I think is not the right way to engage ourselves. And we're not doing Dominica any justice if we continue with a, with a, with a reference of this and that and, and so on. We have a report. And what do we do with the report? Do we throw it out in its entirety or do we seek to see what is it that we have we can agree on, put aside what we don't agree on, let us negotiate 
and then see what we can come up with in negotiations and see what we can fashion legislation that suit the times done and can really address in a fundamental way the concerns that we all have had about the electoral processes in Dominica. May God bless our efforts and may God bless our country, Dominica. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister, and we're calling this consultation to a close. Sorry that we kept you so long, but I think it was important for uh, all views to contend. We have some uh, refreshments for you. Um, it's in the room to, the, to your left, and so we thank you, and we thank um, the, 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 the we thank everyone for um, participating in this discussion, and um, those virtually as well as in this room. So thank you very much, and have a safe journey home. Thank you. I wouldn't be here for you until I pass my gift for you, all right? But my brother, why did I do that watch for you at pass my gift for you? I wouldn't be here until I pass my gift for you. Aaron?